Welcome everyone. I call to order the Beaverton School Board Business Meeting for October 25th, 2021. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that our district rests on the traditional land of the Tualatin Kalapuya. We thank the ancestors of the Kalapuya for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands. We are honored by the collective work of many indigenous nations, leaders, and families who demonstrate resilience, resistance, revitalization, healing, and creativity. Um, we'll start with the roll call of board members. Um, and we will start with zone one, Susan. Here. Uh, zone two, Karen. Presente. Zone three, Eric. Here. Zone four, Sunita. Here. Zone five, Ugana. Present. Zone six, Becky. Here. And zone seven, Tom, I am here. Um, does anyone have any changes they would like to make to the agenda tonight? Okay, hearing none. Um, we will start then by hearing from our, our labor partners. We have uh, Sarah Schmidt from the Beaverton Education Association and Kirsty Sackman from the Oregon School Employees Association. And um, looking forward to hearing from Sarah. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Chair Collette, excuse me, <laughs> Superintendent Grouting and members of the board. Um, my name is Sarah Schmidt and I'm the president of the Beaverton Education Association. Uh, we all started this year excited to be back in school buildings full time with our students and very unsure of what this school year would bring. We knew it would be difficult and that the pandemic is not over. Um, we're in season three now of COVID if you haven't been following along. Um, educators have been showing up to school every day and putting in their very best effort to meet students' needs. However, we are more overwhelmed and strained than ever before. I know the board has already heard the data on staffing shortages that we're experiencing and about the hard work that HR has been putting in to recruit and hire new staff to fill vacancies. What I want to make sure that you understand tonight is what is happening in our schools in the meantime and the urgent uh, attention that needs to be focused on re retaining the current staff that we have now. As I've talked with educators and school leaders over the past week, a uh, few weeks, excuse me, several themes are glaringly apparent. And I wanna list some of the challenges that educators have been dealing with. The first is unmanageable and sustainable workload that has been leading to burnout and educators fearing for their physical and mental health. A much wider array of student academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs than we have ever seen before or are equipped to support. Unclear or conflicting directives from administrators that make it hard to know what to prioritize. Outside pressure to censor what we teach and bad faith efforts to promote distrust in educators and public schools. Plan time that's being used to cover for colleagues due to daily sub shortages, rather than to plan, assess student work, or connect with families. The impact of involuntary transfers into positions or assignments in which educators have little experience and minimal support, and large class sizes and caseloads that are making it very difficult to build relationships with students that we desperately need, or to individualize instruction to meet students' needs. <sighs> That's a lot. Um, it is essential that we make sure that working conditions are manageable for educators and our school staff uh, so that we're able to make it through this year. And this is why we are advocating for meaningful workload relief to be implemented as soon as possible, including taking things off the plate and creating the time that we need to do our jobs and serve our students. Luckily, I think we are on a good path forward to working together on this. I've had several conversations um, with Superintendent Grotting in the last few weeks, and I'm grateful for his thorough understanding of the staffing crisis that we are in and the incredible challenges that our schools and educators are facing this year. We have some ongoing meetings planned to problem solve and implement solutions. Um, to identify those solutions, our BEA uh, members have until tomorrow to complete a survey that we sent out so that we can gather some data about how folks are doing whether or not they're considering other career options and what solutions will help make this year manageable. We also know that these issues are not unique to BSD. 
So we've been in collab working in collaboration with union leaders in Portland, Hillsboro, Eugene, and Salem Kaiser School Districts. Um, their union is asking uh, the same questions of their members so that we can work together to advocate for meaningful solutions. Lastly, I'd like to address BSD families. We see you. We know that this has been difficult on families as well. We know that your children deserve the best quality education, and we want to keep working alongside you to make sure that they have that. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for all the hard work for your members and bringing that to our attention tonight. Um, Kirsty, looking forward to hearing from you. Good evening. Hello, Chair Colette. Nice to see everyone. Hello to Don and the board. Um, my name is Kirsty Sackman. I am the OSCA president. Um, I am a para two working in an uh, elementary specialized program. Um, just wanted to say hello to everyone. Um, and Sarah, thank you for everything you had to advocate for our educators um, and building staff. Uh, you always knock it out of the park with finding just the right words. I don't know how you do it, you're awesome. Uh, our OSCA board has focused uh, our attention the last few months in really engaging in conversations throughout the district um, in, in our different uh, departments and focusing on um, our two MOUs that we were working on. As of last week, we have voted uh, yes to both new MOUs for our classified staff. We have an MOU around the vaccine mandate and how that affects our job and that has passed. Um, and we thank everyone involved in that process for all of the time and meticulous work it took to iron out all those details and all the back and forth meetings. Also, our second MOU that was signed is the hiring and retention bonuses um, for select members of our classified staff. Um, and that has passed as well and is um, moving forward to be implemented. I definitely wanna say a big shout out to Elaine and Susan in HR for their tireless work to get all of these things prepped and out for our members and working with us along our contract timelines to be able to work through these and get this information out to the staff as much as possible. I want to thank all of our members who have been taking extra time to try to get involved and come to conversations around these MOUs to share their thoughts and feelings. I know that we are all working so hard in our buildings, no matter what position you're in, we're all working hard, classified, certified, our school board, our admin, and we, we see the hard work. And I wanna say thank you to all of our classified staff taking that extra time out of their home lives to come back and share and be continue to advocate for themselves, their coworkers, our students, our families, um, and our team as a whole. Uh, I wanna just really shout out, this year is hard and it is different and we're all tired, but to every classified staff showing up every day, putting their best foot forward, despite staffing shortages, despite across all, everywhere, classified, certified, all the extra work you are to make sure our students are staying safe and healthy with uh, our pandemic rules and requirements, as well as just daily life of working with our students. I just want to shout out over and over. I don't think I could ever say enough how much I see everyone working tirelessly. Um, with that, I know there's a lot of people that are feeling burnt out and feeling like they're running out of steam already. And we're not even we're just about 30 days in of school. Um, please keep hanging on, keep fighting that fight, reach out for support from your union, from your peers, from your admin. Please don't be afraid to ask questions, to ask for help, to say you need that break. Because we, if we all crumble, the system crumbles and our students and our families and our community, they crumble with us. And we know that we are here with our big hearts for a reason. So please don't be afraid to ask for help. Keep working so hard, we thank you. And I just thank everyone for being here tonight and their time. Thanks, Kirsty, and, and thanks to your members for all the hard work they're doing to support our kids. Um, okay, so the next portion is public comments. And I just wanna start by noting that we received 45 uh, written public comments. Board members appreciate your comments and thank, thank each and every one of you for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Um, the next part is we're gonna have comments um, from folks via Zoom. Um, and so I have um, 
some important information that I always read before we take those comments about how we're going to hear those tonight. Um, so thank you for attending the school board meeting with us today. Um, we are truly grateful for the presence of all the folks who are coming to share information with us tonight and for the opportunity to receive your input. Uh, one of our district's greatest strengths is community involvement. As we know, your involvement comes from a place of caring for students, families, communities, and staff. Please know that board members do not respond directly to testimony, but we are paying close attention to your comments. We know it can be difficult to testify in public, but we are sincerely interested in hearing your comments and concerns. Uh, we ask that all present model respectful behavior to, to provide an open space in which a variety of viewpoints and perspectives can be shared. With that in mind, a few guidelines. Our comments do not allow for the specific naming of school personnel. Personnel matters should be dealt with either through the complaint process or by contacting a principal or cent central office staff person. If a school personnel is named during a comment period, I will stop your comments and ask you to refrain from naming the person. If it occurs a second time, you'll be asked to end your comments. Comments must be relevant to our current board agenda. If you're speaking on a different subject, you will receive a warning. If a commenter continues to deviate from the board's topic, they will be muted and the testimony ended. Everyone has two minutes to provide testimony to the board. Uh, a timer will be set and will go off at the two minute mark. If you continue talking beyond the two minutes, I will ask you to end your comments. To ensure fair treatment for all of our commenters, this will be enforced uniformly, regardless of subject matter, viewpoint, or whether you've finished your prepared comments. I can understand it's really difficult to provide comments within this shortened time period and recommend that any comments you did not have time to provide orally be sent to the board in an email or uh, paper form. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your comments and we'll start with uh, Robert Coeth. Robert, are you here? You know, it can be hard for folks to unmute sometimes, so I'll give Robert just a second if he's with us. Okay, um, the next person is Jeanette Shada. Jeanette, are you with us? Hello. Hey, all right. When you're ready, I'll start the timer for you. All right. So the anti-racist vision statement has been revised a couple times, but there is an issue with one of the following parts. Beaverton School District owns that our student outcomes currently point to our part in perpetuating institutional racism. Where is the evidence? Myself and my colleagues have asked repeatedly, and the district cannot produce it. Why? Because they don't have it. A child's skin color does not produce academic outcomes. Factors out of a school district control do, such as home, home life, family dynamics, socioeconomic status, abuse, and so much more. The statement is correct that there are still individuals within this district who are perpetuating racism through CRT, and it goes all the way to the top. The BSD administrator over the Office of Equity and Inclusion has stepped into an almost 400,000 contract not following contractual laws that is currently being investigated as a formal complaint on the board and has submitted and has been submitted. The administrator has stated openly three times he is looking at everything through a critical race theory lens and the district has finally um, stated that they are as well in June newsletter. The $400,000 contract actually um, I know many other things that can be spent in with $400,000 that actually unifies rather than divide, such as the five, hiring five to six new teachers to alleviate classroom overcrowding in elementary schools or partnering with the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism or FAIR that actually helps to unify rather than divide. The anti-racist vision statement also states Beaverton School District will authentically engage each student, family, and staff member to build connection, uplifting understanding, and truly value the diversity of our school communities. Are you doing this? Are you truly listening to all constituents? I say, no, you are not. Many parents have come to talk with you and other people in the district about this, and it goes ignored, and you guys keep pushing critical race theory down uh, as shown in the vision statement. You are the elected board and you have that job to be the unifiers and not the buyers. Two minutes, two minutes are up. Thank you. No more CRT. Get rid of it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, next person up is Sarah Smith. I'm 
Sarah, are you there with us? There we go. Does it work? There we go. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. I am here to talk about the upcoming bond. I have worked tirelessly in this community to ensure that public education was supported through participation financially and through volunteerism for a very long time. I have defended this school district and done all I can to try and make this a great place we could trust to educate our children, there, where everyone was welcome and that we could trust that our children were respected, safe, and challenged in their education. I do not see how I can continue to support bonds for a district that has broken these very elemental areas. Your enrollment numbers are down and stop kidding yourself that this is just because of COVID. You have broken the faith and respect of your parents. Parents no longer feel that they can entrust their children to you due to your extremism in not just allowing, but forcing training in politically and personally motivated moral and socially divisive instruction. We have had anti-bullying policies and programs that were positive and built safe environments for everyone. Through, though you have pulled back on some of your more insulting and divisive language in your anti-racist vision statement, it still pushes the boundaries in labeling and creating more division, not in uniting us. We are playing into the political agendas of a few radical groups rather than staying strong with neutrality. You are publicly funded, government regulated, and legally required to be a politically neutral organization. Start acting like one. The hardest part, but most important part of your job as a board member, you set policy that protects all ranges of beliefs and needs. You hire the superintendent and then you ensure that he is enforcing these set policies. You are a representative of our district, not, a one, not of one own group view or definitely not to push your own agenda. I will not support a bond for a district who isn't holding teachers responsible for forcing their personal, political, moral, and social views on our children. A district that will not fight the implementation of the K-5 sex education program. You want to figure out why your numbers are down, why people will not support your bond, ask. Stop using funding to allow racist and political organizations at over $400,000 to do forced, unnecessary, right. unwanted training. We there are it. losing great teachers, parents, and students, and we will lose there. funding if you don't stop. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Um, all right. Next, we have Katja Freeborn. Katja, are you there with us? I am. I'm trying to start my video, but it's not letting me hear. No worries. We're patient. You can't start your video because the whole. Oh, here we go. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. I don't have quite the dramatic presentation prepared. <laughs> Really I'm here one. representing teachers. <laughs> My name is Katia Freeborn. I've been in the district for 28 years and 25 years at Aloha High School. And first of all, thank you for your voluntary service. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for what you're doing for our kids. I appreciate it. I know the staff appreciates it. And I just wanted to let you know how difficult it has been lately with not being able to find substitutes when we need to call in sick. It's super, super stressful when our jobs are not filled. It's very difficult when the secretary sends out emails and asks for people to please cover for a colleague, please cover for a colleague, please cover for a colleague. At my school, I'm at Aloha High School, we have at least three unfilled positions a day, usually more. And it is so stressful. And you can't go do it because you're so busy with your own work. Um, and so I, I just want to express that again. And then um, um, beyond not being able to find a substitute when we need to be sick, we just have to be able to call in sick. I've already had one unfilled position and it's very stressful. Um, we're also being asked to maintain Canvas presentations, calendars, modules, assignments, as well as do the in-class instruction. And it is honestly becoming impossible to maintain all of the um, expectations that we have for students that really need our help. We have special education students that are in super high need situations. We have regular ed kids that are, they're just, they're, I can't even explain it. Two days ago, I had a girl, she was just tearing pages out of her spiral notebook. And I don't even think she noticed what she was doing. And she was crumpling them up and throwing them in the trash. And I, I looked over, I didn't, even, I, I didn't even know why she was doing it, but it's these manic behaviors that we're seeing 
Oh, wow. Okay, that went fast. <laughs> anyway, we need a release valve of some kind. If it's Wednesday early release, that would be great. Or Wednesday's free. Acha, I got to cut you off there. I'm sorry. I know. I, I, I got it. Um, I'm going to check back in and thank you for your comments. Um, uh, Robert Coeth, are you with us? If you are, you want to open your screen? Tom, I, he was in the waiting room and I clicked admit and it's just circling joining right now. He may be having internet issues. Let's give him a moment here and see if we can't hear him tonight. And, and thanks for everyone who came and commented. Um, hopefully we can hear from Robert too. Uh, looks like it didn't take. He, he's, he's gone now. Okay. Okay. Um, well, Robert, if you're out there, um, we all have email addresses. Feel free to, to send along your comments. We always are happy to receive things by email. Um, okay. We'll move on to the next portion of our board meeting now, which is the superintendent report. And looking forward to hearing from you, Don. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Collette, members of the board, um, students, families, and staff. Um, I just once again want to thank our students, all of our families, and school board for your efforts and flexibility during COVID-19. Uh, needless to say, this has probably been the last, uh, as somebody mentioned, we're, in, we're, we're entering into almost the third, third year of this now, and uh, it's, it's one of the most challenging times I've ever seen in education not only in the Beaverton School District, throughout Oregon and throughout our country. Um, the district continues to follow the requirements and guidance from the Oregon Health Authority, the Oregon Department of Education, Washington County Health, and our governor regarding our social distancing, mask wearing, vaccinations, and other guidelines and requirements relating to COVID-19. I want to especially thank our educators, support staff, parents, students, and community for their adherence to these strategies of mask wearing, vaccinations and social distancing that will eventually help us get out of this pandemic. Under vaccinations and testing, the district, uh, as you know, has developed a dashboard to monitor and track the status of our vaccination of our employees and students and of departments and it's updated multiple times daily. As you're aware, the governor mandated that all school employees had to be vaccinated by October 18th or apply and be approved for a medical or religious exception. I am really and so grateful to the Beaverton employees for helping us meet this mandate. Later, you're going to hear from our HR director, Susan Rodriguez, regarding our number of exemptions and percentages for vaccination of our employees. I want to especially thank our HR, communications, IT departments, principals, supervisors, managers, and bargaining unit leadership for their efforts to collect and verify information during this entire process. You will also hear later from Danielle Hudson, our student services director, and Brian Seek, our curriculum and instruction director regarding our efforts to monitor, test, and provide safety protocol guidance during COVID-19. Uh, these lead people have been just absolutely instrumental and in their teams in making this happen. And I wanna talk about a positive note. Um, we have received information that vaccination approval for our five to 11 year olds will become official around November 7th or 8th. Today, we were in a meeting with County Health Department and they are preparing to be able to provide community vaccinations in the Beaverton School District, as well as looking at entire Washington County. And I know Deputy uh, Superintendent Carl Mead has been convening weekly conversations with various stakeholders to develop a process once the vaccinations become available. 
Today, we were told that there will be a localized large site, which will be Tektronics. And um, the reason they're gonna use Tektronics is the ability to have curbside service to where actually these folks could come up and provide vaccinations in cars. As you know, if you can remember back when you were five, six, seven, getting a shot is not the most uh, popular thing to be doing when you're a student. Sometimes having their parents right there, maybe in a little bit of enclosed. I think I heard Dr. Perez told me uh, the way that she gets through vaccination, she, uh, right when they, she gives her kids a big bear hug and right when the bear hug comes, the, do the, the doctor or the nurse is uh, sticking in it in the arm. So we wanna make sure that we um, are getting as many vaccinations out there. The county is also really wanting to look at an equity lens. Where in our community is it, you know, maybe difficult, whether it's around transportation, geographic area for those students and parents to become vaccinated. So uh, I think Dr. Mead will talk to you. We're working with multiple stakeholders, Virginia Garcia, pediatricians, and our pharmacies, local pharmacies to make that happen. So we're excited about that. Uh, this is coming, it's gonna get here quickly. And what we're really hopeful for is once we get the majority of our students vaccinated, maybe we can begin in county health and the state of Oregon will be looking at maybe providing some flexibility, whether it's around social distancing, um, some other things that we can get back to a little bit of normal. But I think uh, I was really, really upbeat today hearing from uh, our, our county health. They're preparing, we're preparing, and we're gonna do everything possible to make sure that regardless of where you live in our community, that you're going to have access to the vaccination if you so choose. Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, well, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about budget and enrollment. And as you know, most districts in Oregon and across the nation, they are experiencing drop in enrollment due to COVID-19. There are other areas where various districts, depending their enrollments going down. I also wanna remind you that birth rates in Washington County are declining. So we are uh, seeing birth rates decline. Later tonight, you will hear from Assistant Superintendent of Finance, Mike Schofield, and Deputy Superintendent Carl Mead of Operations regarding our latest enrollment projections and the future financial impact on the district. You will also be informed about our ESSER and SIA funding and spending as we meet the challenges of COVID-19. And I think you heard from two or three folks tonight who testified and, uh, the mental health issues that we're seeing with our students, we're seeing with our staff, and we're seeing with families is very real. As we travel and traverse through COVID-19, it is apparent that this virus has taken a toll on our students, staff, families, and communities. We have been fortunate to have ESSER and SIA dollars to provide additional staffing in our schools to help our students. One of the issues all school districts are experiencing are significant staff shortages on both the teaching and learning and operation sides of our education environment. We have the money, uh, we are advertising, and we currently have literally hundreds of positions open right now. Uh, and Beaverton is no different than any other district where um, you heard from a, a teacher, sub shortages. Right now, our counselors, um, uh, we have central office staff, we have people, principals today. I was at Westview High School today and I went to meet, I was going, wanted to meet with the visiting classrooms, wanted to meet with the principal and the principal, Matt Peterson, he was substituting in a class today because they did not have a substitute. Sub shortages are very real. We're working with our HR department, looking at different types of incentives to uh, be able to go out and get substitutes in all different types of classifications. We're working with um, uh, local government agencies to find flexibility in licensing. 
as well as trying to do some marketing and reaching out to people. We've done some different type of pay incentives for different, for different folks, um, but substitute shortages are at a critical stage. Our staff is doing an incredible job of pitching in, covering these shortages, often giving up their planning time, covering extra periods, assuming other job duties, and working longer hours to meet the needs of our children. It is only October, but it does feel like it's the end of the year. District leadership is working with our union leadership to investigate ways we can work differently to ease some of the hardships and provide some relief to acknowledge the incredible efforts of our staff. Having our employees supported and ready to meet the needs of our students during these incredibly difficult times is our priority. And then I just wanna end on a real positive note. While we continue to have and meet significant challenges, it is important to note, we are serving nearly 40,000 students with in-person and online instruction daily. Students are being educated, they are learning, they're socializing and progressing academically, socially and emotionally, thanks to the care, the compassion, expertise, and hard work of our staff and partnerships with our families and other education partners. And today I was fortunate to be in an ACL class and I can tell you those students were doing amazing. The teacher was amazing. But after the class was over, the teacher said, this is, this is, the, most, this is the most difficult thing she's ever done in her life. And um, she, you know, she feels inadequate and she says, I, I, it's not about the money. It's not about working any longer or any harder. It's just what it is. Uh, she's supposed to have a couple instructional assistants in her classroom and they're, they're not there because we can't hire them. So uh, we're trying everything we can. Uh, I know um, seven of the largest uh, school district superintendents, we are going to meet with our union presidents uh, soon and, and talk about things like staffing shortages, way to diversify our workforce, and some of the issues that we're dealing with right now. So. Um, while at sometimes we might seem to be at odds with each other, this is one where we have agreement. We're in a very difficult and tough situation, and we're going to try to do whatever we can to serve students. But please know that uh, seeing a lot of happy faces in schools and uh, teachers are working hard, support staff are working hard, uh, administrators are working hard, and our kids are in school and uh, they weren't in school last year. And uh, that did take a toll and we're seeing some of that. So I wanna thank this school board for your support in recognizing the efforts of our, of our staff, but also recognizing what our families need and uh, the needs of our students. That's all I have, Chair Collette. Thanks, Superintendent Grodin. Um, Looking forward to hearing um, some of the ways we can support staff through a very difficult year. So uh, keep us in the loop. Um, our next report is an enrollment update with uh, Deputy Superintendent Mead. Good evening, Chair Collette, school board members, and Superintendent Grotting. Thank you. Um, you received in your packet a 16-page report on enrollment. I know you've memorized those numbers and have chewed them up backwards and forwards. Um, I just will take a couple of minutes just to go over kind of a 30,000-foot view of those of that document. Page one reflects uh, our actual enrollment for the school year at 39,376. This is an annual count that we use from September 30th on an annual basis for comparison's sake. So we can look back over years past as kind of a checkpoint. That is actually down by 335 students as compared to last year. Pages two, three, and four provide you specific grade level totals at each school throughout the district for the current year. It's also important for you as you get concerns from the community to have an understanding of where those grade level amounts are as people talk about class size and you have that information in front of you. And if you need that updated throughout the course of the year, please let us know, happy to provide that to you. Pages five, six, and seven provide a, four, a rolling four year look back at each school, elementary region, and the title school grouping. On page six, you'll notice this year, there are significant reductions at several of our middle schools. I wanna remind you that's because of the implementation of our school boundary changes for middle school. It's not because of a loss of students there, it was a boundary change that was implemented. Pages eight, nine, 10, and 11. These simply provide you the data of our actual enrollment versus projected 
enrollment across the district. As you know, we go forward each year in trying to forecast where our numbers are going to be. Most years we're pretty on target with those numbers across the board. There's just a lot of unknown factors this year, as you can well imagine. Pages 12 through 15 provide enrollment, enrollment counts by our specialized program or of our specialized programs and grade levels across the district. And I sent you a separate email late this afternoon. You probably have not had a chance to see it. Um, I know the acronym SOUP is very confusing when it comes to our specialized program. So I sent you a separate document that articulates each of those programs and the type of um, profile of a student that are in those programs. So that should help you there. Then on page 15, I uh, also provided you with the number of students placed in programs outside of the district based on the unique needs of these students. And I believe that number is 95 students this year. And then finally on page 16, it simply articulates our overall projection error rate, which was approximately 3% this year. 3% when we're forecasting so many unknowns is not a bad number at all. Um, when we take a look at the big picture of things, for Robert, I think it was 3% too much. Um, and he is our, our demographer and has a lot of pride in this work, uh, works closely within our department, but also with Mike as we're forecasting funding for future years as well. So I am happy to take any questions that you may have. Uh, board members, any questions? Eric? One quick question. Like I know that um, across the state, I know that um, attendance is down. Do you get any feel that um, are we are proportional to like all other districts in the state or is our pain points a little higher or lower? I know during public testimony, they made some accusations about why we're down, but I feel like when I looked at the numbers across the state, I thought they're down this consistently because people are worried to send their kids into school right now and flex and other programs are supplementing that. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, and Eric, the answer is yes. Um, our numbers are our numbers are actually relatively good in comparison to other districts across the state. Um, there are some districts that are significantly down and we're not close to that. I don't have the exact figures from everyone. I had four conversations today with some of those districts just to get a sense, um, but I can absolutely gather that information for us as a, as a school district and send that to you in an email. Be happy to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Karen? Hi, my, my question um, is around the preparation. So as we get our students vaccinated um, ages five to 11, so that'd be up to sixth grade. Um, I see that some of our numbers of um, students that are not, like some schools have 114 less students, 88, 77 in my area. And so I'm wondering about how you're planning and how you're out um, reaching out to parents to see who's planning on returning when they're vaccinated, um, whether they're returning this year or next year. Um, so that's what I'm wondering about and how we're supporting our principals in, in that process. Excellent, great question, Dr. Perez. Uh, and I apologize, you had sent that to me beforehand and I slipped and not provided that information to you. Um, Primarily what we're looking at is our students in flex. And we have asked for at least a quarter by quarter commitment by those families. And so as we're approaching the end of this quarter, we're asking those families if specifically they plan on staying the next quarter and or plan on returning to school sooner than later based on the vaccination availability. And right now we have approximately 20 students out of our flex enrollment that have designated, parents have designated that they plan on returning back to their area school. So 20 out of our we're well over 1,500 at this point in time of our flex students um, plan on returning to school. Now, it's not 100% accurate by any stretch, um, but we also have a wait list of 90 additional students to get into flex that are currently sitting in our schools. So we had closed enrollment for the first for the remainder of the first quarter. So at the end of the second, or sorry, the beginning of the second quarter, those 90 students potentially will be able to enroll. So again, it's while we may gain more students in flex and they'll decrease actually in our area schools, it may counter over time. And part of this has to be, I think, parents' own experience and what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And in terms of quarantine and all those other factors, um, I know there's a lot of frustration around the quarantine factor for, for kids when they're exposed up to 10 days at home and the miss of school, missing school and that type of thing. So, and in terms of support for principals, um, I know that that's an ongoing conversation that Ginny and the team is having down in teaching and learning to how do we actually provide that level of support? And what's that support going to need to look like? 
We're going to have to be very creative as we take a look at staffing as those students come back, and we're going to have to take a look at class sizes too. So that's not only um, Jenny Hansman's team, it's also our business office and taking a look at that. And I'm not suggesting that we would do this, but typically how we would deal with those enrollment changes would typically be staff transfers. Um, probably not the best option for us to do that at a semester or something like that this far through the year um, or even at the quarter. So we're going to have to take a look at the resources we have available to make those balances happen. Becky? Um, Dr. Mead, you, I, I, like, I appreciated that um, update. My question is going to be when we do have those vaccinations and we know that's going to take a while to roll out when will we reevaluate the guidelines that we are following here? Because it seems like, especially like how we're doing lunch and if we're, if they're still not, everyone's not vaccinated at the same time, um, when will we review the guidelines of how the protocols of, of, of how different things are done as, as students will be on a, a, a continuum there? Mm -hmm. Those, those are great questions, Becky. Um, those are ongoing information. That's ongoing information that comes to us from OHA. Uh, Oregon Health Authority, as well as county, county health. And they are the ones who set those parameters for us. So as Don mentioned, he was on a call today. I get, I'm in two conversations each week with the county as well. Um, and so as soon as the county, because they're not going to do this by district, district by district, and we're not permitted to make those changes individually. It is done as a county working with OHA. So we are hopeful that by the first of the year, because it's going to take, um, most of our students are going to end up taking Pfizer or Moderna. And it's a minimum of a six week time frame from that first vaccination until they have full immunity. Um, so we're talking the after the first of the year. So we are hopeful based on the numbers of students. We hope there's a lot of students who take advantage of the vaccine um, that we may see some positive changes happen. Other questions from board members? All right, I'm not, re oh. Karen? I was wondering if is this process for looking at um, whether some of our students who um, qualify for special education, those numbers were down as well. Is that the same process of reaching out to parents? Is that the same process for them as in the other K through 12, figuring out if they're coming back or not? Or I guess K through six. Because I see our numbers were down. So you spoke to the work that you're doing to figure out if they're coming back, but I didn't know um, with our SPED counts, if that's, you think that would be impacted too with the vaccines or if we have any information on that. Very happy to see Dr. Hudson pop up on the screen. So. Um, good evening board. Um, good evening, Dr. Perez. Yes. So when we have students who unenroll in the district, we have a pretty formal process for re-engaging those families through multiple letters and communications to try to find out where the students are. I think the thing that is kind of, um, difficult is our kindergarten enrollment is really low this year. And so one of the things we have is we have a lot of students who um, those who traditionally might go to a specialized program when they start kindergarten are starting in kindergarten or their parents are waiting and delaying a start. So we have a lot of students who we um, we assume we'll enroll possibly next year because parents were really worried about enrolling them in kindergarten with everything COVID related. Additionally, we do have some families who have students who are really significantly um, uh, medically fragile. And so the risk of being in school was far too much for them. So they decided to either to homeschool. Um, unfortunately, our flex program is not set up for students with really complex needs and disabilities. And so those parents have, and we have an obligation to provide a free appropriate public education, which in those cases would be within our school setting and not in a virtual environment. So it has, uh, those families have had to make decisions to do alternative things. But I do think one of the biggest impact in our specialized program enrollment is really that we haven't had students in school for the last two years. And we are really being um, 
cautious about placing any new students into specialized programs because we would not want to place a student in a program if it's really the result of the pandemic and not in fact the result of a, um, a disability. So I know those teams are really trying to determine is it disability or is it um, the result of a lack of instruction due to the pandemic. Other questions from the board? Okay, great. Next, we'll be hearing from um, Administrator for Accountability Bridges about um, the Division 22 compliance and assurances. Thank you, Chair Collette, members of the board, Superintendent Grouting. So what is Division 22? I'll give you a little bit of background that wasn't included in the situation sheet. But chapter 581 of the state rules applies to the Department of Education and schools and districts and the department are to follow those rules. And the rules are organized into divisions. So there's division 15 on special education, division 19 on pre-K, division 23 on finance, division 26 on charter schools, Division 21, which is on school governance and student conduct. So there are rules around things like student records, uh, vision screening, uh, all capital or uh, corporal punishment. But Division 22, which is referred to as standards for schools and districts, kind of has an elevated presence. So even though schools and districts are expected to follow all of the rules outlined in Division 22, uh, in Chapter 581, Division 22 has a provision in law that says state school funds can be withheld by the Department of Education if a district is not in compliance with the rules in Division 22, which describe what a standard school is or a standard district is and the district has not submitted a plan of correction or the district is, has submitted a plan of correction but is not implementing that plan in a timely manner. So where do we stand with Division 22? We are, as you saw in the report, we're in compliance with 47 of the 53 Division 22 requirements. And there were three rules that were waived by the State Board of Education for the last school year. And to sum up, I would say that our non-compliance with the six rules that are outlined in the report are really due to the pandemic. So it's either changes in practice. So we were not in compliance with instructional time because we provided teachers more time for preparation and planning related to implementing comprehensive distance learning, or we, we, we relieved the burden of teachers at the elementary level to assess students that were either for the whole year or three quarters of the year engaging in comprehensive distance learning. We relieved them of the burden of trying to determine where that student is relative to state standards in all of the areas on the report card. Or the other piece is just the availability of staff resources to conduct, let's say business as usual. So it's hard to implement a social science adoption when it's difficult to access teachers and community members to do the work of the cadre or the project team to identify what are the learning targets, what are the best practices, and to adopt instructional materials. It was difficult last year and we didn't attempt it to evaluate our alternative education programs. You saw that in Dr. Mead's report that we have special education students that are in outside placements. It's difficult to expect to go in and say, I want to evaluate your program when those services are being delivered to students under the conditions of the pandemic. 
I'll leave it at that and I would be happy to answer any questions from the board related to the report and our status on the Division 22 rules. Questions from board members? Pugana? Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I was trying to unmute. Thank you so much, John, for that information. My only question would be on, um, I see that just like you mentioned, we are out of compliance on um, every student belongs. I also see that um, an administrative rule detailing the response procedure to bias incidents will be developed prior to the start of 2021 to 2022. So my question is, is this rule currently being worked on so that we would not be out of compliance the next time that um, some kind of, uh, you know, the next time that they review this, so that we'll be in compliance. So are you already developing this rule since it mentions that it's gonna be prior to the start of 2021 to 2022 school year? I believe that's where we are in. So I'm wondering if that rule has already been um, processed or something. Yes, it has. Thank you for that question. The complaint procedure is in the administrative regulation for the every student, all student belongs a policy that you're gonna adopt a revision to tonight on the consent agenda. That administrative regulation was finalized in August. And so we have that piece in place and now it's a matter of just communicating with staff and students about those complaint procedures so that they're well aware of how to surface uh, issues related to the all students belong policy. Thank you. Sunita. I think you're muted, Sunita. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, thanks for the information that was provided to us and answering my questions in the email. Um, my question is, you mentioned that the funding can be withheld if the school is not compliant or does not follow the corrective, uh, corrective uh, suggestions that are given in a timely manner. Um, at what point, is it just a number of like out of 53, 47, is that considered okay? right now or is if they don't follow like maybe they're out of compliance for half of it how where do we stand if we compare with another school district uh, can you do you know that i okay. do not know that so all districts it could be we could figure that out with some research all districts submit this report to the department of education and it's due november 15th but this is a relatively recent requirement the last two years that districts post this report. And in fact, this year, they're required to use this template and post this report on our website. So we could do some checking around with our peer districts and find out how they're doing. I know that a district very close to the west of us had the same issue with instructional time and they are reporting to their board that they did not meet that rule and are implementing corrective act, a uh, plan of correction for, to remedy that this school year. Okay, thank you. Um, I, just a little more context there, Sunita, I think is a great question about um, the department's enforcement of division 22 requirements. Um, the, to my knowledge, in recent memory, no district has ever been sort of docked funds as a result of a lack of compliance. I think the key piece here is that the districts are identifying the areas that they're out of compliance and developing a correct corrective action to return to compliance, right? Now, if a district did not, if, if, if we, had, we, we were not in compliance with the instructional time and we developed a corrective action that said, well, 10 years from now, we'll get into compliance, I'm betting the department would have words for us, right? But that's obviously not what we've done here. The generally year in and year out, most of the time, you will see districts fall in and out of compliance with instructional minutes based on inclement weather, right? And or other policy related issues. Districts are required to have a policy around X and maybe they just didn't get around in time and their corrective action is, 
our board will be adopting it by this date and be in compliance. That's that is garden variety where you see Division 22 coming into play as it relates to districts being in and out of compliance. If, if I can, Sunita, a lot of it sometimes will be also around curriculum issues, whether it's yeah. uh, adoption of different various pieces of curriculum and sometimes it can be a funding related issue to districts, you know, they they just haven't uh, they haven't adopted curriculum and it's because of funding so some of it would be you know when when we're able to attain the correct resources we can do it i know that just because of the uh, not only the pandemic but when you think about some of the school districts that incurred some of the wildfires they're grossly out of uh, uh, compliance with some of the division 22 standards Usually what would happen uh, before uh, they're gonna take your uh, dollars, uh, I would get a call from Colt Gill, the deputy superintendent um, uh, with the governor. And he would say, I wanna have a heart-to-heart uh, -heart conversation with you, Don, about uh, you're, you're not being in compliant with division 22 and or you're not, you're not uh, make, trying to make corrective actions. Um, I have not heard that happening too many times, uh, uh, but uh, that, that would probably be the department would uh, contact the superintendent and definitely, you know, if, if something wasn't, uh, they didn't feel good about that, I'm sure that the, they would reach out to the board chair. Yeah, yeah, I actually went after reading that there are not too many that we are out of compliance yeah. with and there is corrective action, which is being you know, like in a timely manner, like in ne next year we'll be done. My main one was anti-bias one and then the adoption of materials because I uh, just want to make sure that we go ahead with that so that the kids yeah. get what they need. So. Appreciate that, Sunita. Yeah. Karen, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, kind of pointing out the same things that um, Ugana and Sunita had pointed out and what, I had one question around the curriculum adoptions. Is it that we didn't have the money or is it just the time piece um, where they already budgeted for? And then I had asked earlier and um, Dr. Bridges and asked if the, um, for the one with implementation of like the hours, if we were in compliance with the new middle school schedule and he had told me, yes, we are in compliance in middle school, um, even with the changes with the hours. But for the adoption ones, I was wondering if it was an issue of just time because of COVID and all that, or if, it, if we already had budgeted for those curriculum materials. And thank you for that question, Dr. Perez. I'd turn that over to Dr. Sika, who runs our quality curriculum cycle. He's got all the details for you on that. Thanks, Dr. Bridges. Thanks, Dr. Perez. Great question. Um, it, each So we're on the social sciences. It's a little complex. That's such a nuanced adoption. It had been many years from a um, widespread adoption in our in our district. So it, it's a little of both actually. The, the money was in place um, the year pre-COVID, I guess that would have been uh, 2018, um, 2019 school year and uh, hit a budget freeze. And so we, at that time, we felt fine about our timeline, no problem putting it on pause. So we did put it on pause. Unfortunately, we put it on pause right into the start of a global pandemic. And so um, we knew COVID would slow it down. And so with social sciences, we prioritized getting middle school as far as we could because of the implementation of the common middle school experience. We wanted, that, we wanted those students and those teachers to have those resources. Um, been working closely with the state. Our corrective action actually was approved um, today. Um, you know, they received superintendent signature. And so everything's full speed ahead. Um, with science, everything is through on the adoption. That's uh, the, the elementary science materials you might've saw in your report. That's right on what Don was talking about. Just sometimes as budgets ebb and flow, um, just delaying the full purchase of all the materials for a year, just simply due to budgetary reasons. But um, the, the board has adopted the, everything through the QCC and we have the plan to get back into full compliance shortly. So yeah, just a, a little bit of both there, but hopefully that explains things. Any other questions, comments from the board? Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Bridges. Appreciate the report. Um, I've been watching this for a couple of years now and seeing some of the things that we come in and out of compliance with. Um, and obviously we wanna be in compliance with everything. Um, but from what I've observed over the years, I'm actually quite grateful that we were not more out of compliance um, considering everything that we went through with COVID. And I think that speaks to a lot of good work in our district um, to make sure that kids were getting what they needed at a very difficult time. So thank you for that. And now we have uh, Associate Superintendent Schofield uh, with our monthly budget report. Thank you, Chair Collette, members of the board, Superintendent Grouting, appreciate the opportunity. I've looked at your agenda. You have a very full agenda this evening. So I'll be brief with my comments on the, uh, on the monthly financial update. Uh, you have several sections included. One is uh, general fund activity and forecast uh, through September 30th. You also have a summary of revenue and expenditures and encumbrances for all other funds. You have the school staff report as well as an uh, uh, investment report uh, that's broken out a couple different ways. Uh, on the general fund uh, activity and forecast, I would just state that uh, the numbers haven't changed much. We brought down our costs of associated payroll just a little bit due to a Blue Cross Blue Shield rebate that will, the district will be receiving uh, this year. Uh, other than that, we've made no changes. Remember last month, we uh, decreased the amount of revenue coming from the state school fund based on the enrollment report you just heard. Uh, so we've already brought that number down. In addition to that, uh, just a, the gentle reminder, we're still in bargaining. The numbers you see don't reflect the cost of living increase that still needs to be bargained with all groups. And hopefully we'll get that done soon. And I'm happy to take any questions. Questions from the board? Great. Then Mike, I think you're gonna hang on here and be joined by Deputy Superintendent Mead and Deputy Superintendent Hansman. And we have the trilogy of ESSER one, two, and three, I believe, which is almost ex as exciting as Star Wars. Uh, if you can explain to us those long acronyms. Yes, or, may or maybe more exciting. Thank you, uh, Chair Collette. Well, I'll get this uh, started, this, this presentation started. And uh, when uh, Carl mentioned the alphabet soup earlier, we're gonna get you right into a bunch of acronyms here. Uh, right away uh, at the beginning of this. Uh, so we're gonna provide update on our federal corona, coronavirus resource update. Uh, if you go to the next slide, David, we'll take a look at that. Here we go with the alphabet soup. We have ESSER 1, which is elementary and secondary school emergency relief, which is a part of CARES, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. We're gonna talk a little bit about ESSER 2, which is a part of CRRSA, which was Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Uh, that occurred about last December. And then ESSER 3, which is a part, uh, which is a part of ARP, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we received word in, I think, February, March time period, I think around February, that we'd be getting funds, uh, what we've deemed as ESSER 3, as a part of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, the values guiding ESSER 3 uh, and the process we've undertaken, uh, equity, bring students at the margins to the center, adaptability, uh, making the most available resources to support students, and efficiency, you'll see some of that, a plan that draws from work that was already completed. Next slide. So Oregon Department of Education uh, is our pass-through entity from these federal dollars. And um, they put together the requirements and what and the expectations on how school districts would uh, budget for and spend uh, ESSER funds. And there are three parts of the ESSER 3 plan that were identified by ODE. One is the ARP federal funding, the money that's coming to us. Uh, the second is the student investment account, the SIA, ongoing learning and engagement. Uh, significant work was done in school districts across the state of Oregon just prior to the pandemic about additional needs of students. Uh, it had significant community outreach, significant staff engagement. And so what ODE thought was, let's rely on some of that information districts have already gathered to help uh, inform us on spending priorities moving forward with ESSER 3. And finally, Ready Schools, Safe Learners, the Continuity of Services Plan, that's the health and safety part of the program. And uh, you'll see where we plan to spend some money 
uh, in those areas as well. Next slide. Uh, districts, districts will use uh, the ODE planning toolkit uh, to track strategies. So you'll see we have 46.4 million in ESSER three dollars. 20% of ESSER three must be used to address unfinished learning activities. That's the one significant requirement we see in ESSER three. And unlike ESSER one and two, the district must report on efforts to measure and address unfinished learning. So a little bit more compliance oriented and, and just a little bit uh, uh, more direction from the federal government on, on how we're spending ESSER three funds. Next slide. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, as you know, ESSER 3 has requirements around um, engagement, community engagement and learning. And it mirrors um, what we did with the SIA funding and the student investment account. As you remember, we did extensive work with our community to engage them and the ESSER 3 mirrored that process. It also informs the SIA process that we went through. It informs all of our, the decisions that we made for our ESSER 3 district plan. And we continue, it is ongoing, so we continue to involve our community in that process. The SIA also um, required a needs assessment, and that needs assessment that we did through the SIA process informed um, where we were going with our ESSER 3 district plan and the dollars that were spent there. And also we, as I said before, we are embedding all of those ESSER investments and making sure that we are having ongoing student investment account engagement process throughout the next few years. Next slide, please. Also, um, as you know, and Mike had already um, said that the Ready School Safe Learners cont Continuity of Service Plan is what we've been following. There's a link there to that plan, the resiliency framework for the 21-22 school year, if you wanna take a look. But that, that is what has driven our ESSER 3 district plan as well. It is a State Board of Education plan requirement that we are required to do. And as a district, we, were, we are required to include investments of at least 20% of the total funding towards any unfinished learning that we have had, along with requiring engagement of migrant students and families and incarcerated youth. Next slide. Thanks, Jenny, this one's mine. Uh, ESSER one recap, about a year ago, we received these funds. We received uh, about 10.1 million from ESSER one, and we spent most of that money during the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, we spent those funds primarily on teachers, You'll see noted in parentheses there, the SIA shortfall. Uh, as you may recall, when we originally budgeted for SIA, we thought we'd have 32 million. We ended up getting a little over 10 million. Uh, so we used $3 million of ESSER 1 to help shore up that SIA shortfall. We spent a couple million dollars on Chromebooks, a uh, million and a half on COVID related PPE and supplies, 700,000 on return to school planning and technology, uh, 400,000 into nutrition services, 200 million in indirect costs that we recover uh, to, to help pay for the overhead of this grant and $100,000 that was sent to charter and private schools. At the bottom of this, you see in, in bold and, and italicized 2.2 million child care subsidy. That was money that was passed on to us from Washington County out of Washington County's ESSER 1 funds uh, that, we, that, that they directed us to use as a child care subsidy. And so we administered that program uh, last November and December, and that was worth about $2.2 million. So ESSER 1 is essentially complete. Next slide. ESSER 2 and 3, we received 20.7 million in funds from ESSER 2 and 46.4 million from ESSER 3. Uh, both ESSER 2 and 3 funds were included in the 2021-2022 budget. So we knew the money was coming. We didn't necessarily have all of the budget uh, put together and the needs assessment done, and you'll see some of the results of that here in a future slide. Uh, total plan was 67.1 million. And overall, the, uh, the final deadline, and that's primarily for ESSER 3, is September 30th, 2024. That's when funds must be spent. 
Uh, just to note, it allows us time to be thoughtful and flexible about the planned uses for these funds over the next three years. So uh, the plans you you have probably reviewed as it, this was in your board packet uh, and, and how we spend moving forward is adaptable and adjustable over time. Next slide. Here's kind of a, a, a more visual way of looking at it. You see in 2020, 2021 in blue, we received 10.1 million. ESSER two, we spent uh, about $400,000 of it. Um, it. So that's for the 2020-2021 year. In 21-22, we'll spend 16.4 million of ESSER two and about 14 million of ESSER three funds. In 22-23, you see the number goes down in ESSER two to 3.8 million. That uses up the rest of ESSER two, which again is must be spent by September of 2023. And then you see ESSER three kicks in to, for, as 23 million um, uh, in 2022-23. In 23-24, we spend the final 9.5 million with, a, again, a deadline of September 30th, 2024. Next slide. In deciding what, um, where we were gonna spend our funding for ESSER two and three, we needed to prioritize and we needed to make sure that we were moving in the right direction with um, both our student investment uh, account along with our staffing allocation methodology. But the first um, order of business to do that I know that many of you um, know these questions by heart by now, but we did take into consideration the equity lens questions from the very beginning from looking at all of our investments that we were about to do. We looked at whose voice is and isn't represented in this decision who does this decision benefit or burden? Is this decision in alignment with the BSD equity policy? And does this decision close or widen the access opportunity and expectation gaps? So with each of our investments, we took a look at those questions and make sure that we were following those. A big part of how we decided what would go into ESSER two and three is to look at the priorities that were outlined from our community engagement with our student investment account and our SAM model and looked at those priorities. We also did um, a survey of our administrators for um, what the needs were with, their S with the ESSER funding and looking at our needs assessment that we used for our SIA as well. And finally, um, we took um, a survey in January of 2020 of all, all of the community and the staff um, to see what their priorities were when investing in ESSER. Next slide, please. And on the operations side, primarily, as you can see, it's focused on HVAC. Uh, you'll see the first bullet, provide mechanical ventilation in two elementary school gyms. Specifically, that is at Barnes Elementary and West TV Elementary School. Neither school has any ventilation in those areas. Improve ventilation in one of our elementary school gyms. Based on our own evaluation, it was determined that we needed to make some improvements at Montclair. The second bullet are contracts uh, that we were able to secure. Uh, number one is for boiler preventative maintenance, and then second to augment HVAC response. It allows us to be able to respond quicker and um, almost immediately to the needs of our schools when we potentially have a breakdown of the system or we're having difficulties in an air handler or something along those lines. Our third bullet there, miscellaneous repairs for HVAC parts. We've got several schools that we are going to be going in and making some significant repairs in, specifically at Kenneman and Errol Hassel, Heighton, Southridge. Um, those are some needed um, repairs that need to take place there. And then finally, repair of large chillers, specifically at Nancy Riles and various ha air handler units across the school district. So these are dollars that will be an, an enormous resource for us to make some significant improvements in our HVAC systems, which is a major part of what we're trying to do to alleviate the spread of COVID in our schools. As Mike talked about before, there were eight different strategies that we used for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 that we were required to do. And of those eight, four of those fell into the teaching and learning. The first one being empowering adaptable instruction, time and attention, relationships and mental health support, and family and community partnerships. And Carl had the and next one. And continue part. with that as I was just, yes, I was, <laughs> um, with regard to HVAC, this continues in this, as you know, for us to even be able, able to open our doors for school, 
we have to make sure that we've got five, five air exchanges in each of the areas in which we have students um, or staff throughout the day. So it's to make sure that we're improving air, indoor air quality and school facility report, repairs and improvements as quickly as possible. Um, as you know, we made significant purchases um, with technology over the course of the summer to help improve and make sure that we had the necessary devices for kids and then maintain the operations and continuity of services. This has been a, it's definitely a big one in terms of HVAC and you've been aware this year, we've had a couple of times with power outages. We've had to move very quickly to evaluate the length of time and the access to outdoor ventilation in those situations. Um, and at times, as you're aware, I believe it was about a week and a half ago, we needed to dismiss Merlot um, earlier, or community school earlier than normal um, because of the lack of electricity to operate our systems. And we do not have the availability of opening windows in that facility. And then finally, implementation of public health protocols. This guidance comes from OHA as well as our own uh, county partners. And we absolutely have to make sure that we are up and running across the systems to be able to operate. Next slide. So I'll take this one. Um, this just shows the distribution and percentage of the dollars uh, that are available in ESSER two and three and kind of where those commitments are. So you see the largest commitment is under that time and attention um, strategy, uh, next relationships and mental health supports and so on and so forth. But uh, those are just there to show you kind of how those dollars uh, were spread out among those eight different strategies. Next slide. School and department breakdown. This gives you a glimpse of kind of what's going on in each of the next three years. You see the darker blue is direct to schools and then student services, MLD, TNL, so on and so forth. Uh, you will see that uh, in year one, we're spending about a little over $30 million. Uh, year two, 26.8 million. You'll see again that operations uh, becomes a bigger number in year two as we try to ratchet down as the board has been concerned about uh, at least three different times you told me to be careful as we look at how we staff uh, using these ESSER funds that we have a way to stair step down the staffing over time. Uh, and you'll see that here in a moment. Um, but that's just kind of the spending plan broken into those groups in each uh, school year of service. Next slide. So this is a little better breakdown of salary versus non-salary. We've got a little bit in reserve in each year, again, because we are literally uh, finding out new things, uh, addressing new needs, and various implications on at least a weekly basis. Uh, Jenny, Carl, and I meet weekly to talk about new issues that have come up in schools that need to be addressed with funds uh, as they relate to those eight strategies mentioned above. Uh, you can see our schedule right now is that we'd spend about that 30.8 million and that about 58% of that would be salary in the first year. Then you see in the next year, 26.8 million with about 13.1 uh, million in salary. And then finally in year uh, three in the 23, 24 school year, it's been about 6.4 million in salary. Uh, so that's the breakdown, uh, at least of where the plan is currently on salary versus non-salary. Next slide. Staff investment, this is what it looks like. We've given you a couple different breakdowns in terms of uh, where those resources are currently committed. We've got 91.9 FTE. If you look at the top left, uh, going to schools, drop to the bottom and you see, you see the total FTE count of 141.6 in, in the current year, 96.2 the following year, and then the subsequent year, 47 uh, FTE. FTE by type, again, uh, majority is licensed here. There is some classified uh, in 2122, in uh, dropping off in 22, 23, and 23, 24. Um, but those are the those are the staff investments. Next slide. Uh, again, a little bit more of a breakdown when you talk about the license, what is it? Uh, we've got some classroom teachers in this year, uh, student success coaches across the next couple of years, um, going down a little bit in the 23, 24 year academic coaches for a couple, the next couple of years. Uh, I won't go through each of these, but you can kind of see the position breakdowns and how that 141 uh, FTE in year one compares to the 96 compares to the 47. And we have some positions that have not yet been posted. Again, I think that is simply due to uh, our um, uh, general bandwidth of getting everything organized and in place 
and ready to post uh, and getting positions filled when we have so many open positions and needs currently. So that's on us to get those going. Next slide. Non-salary investments, this is kind of what it looks like. You see the summer learning grant. Um, that was the grant we received from the Oregon Department of Education this summer. We've currently reserved 3.7 million as our 25% match. I don't know that we'll need all of that. I don't think we will. So at a future update, you'll probably see that investment go down, but that, that is how we intended to fund the 25% match from the state summer learning grants. Student devices, uh, again, uh, under one of the strategies, you see what we're spending in 21-22, uh, 22, 23, and 23, 24. Uh, HVAC repairs, you see those going across significant investment in the second year, 2022, 2023. That gives Carl and his team time to get designs in place in the first year and actually get the work done in year two uh, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Okay, so next steps, uh, the virus continues to alter our plans and spending. Um, if you would have looked at this plan a couple of months ago, it would look different than it looked a month ago. Uh, so we, this, this plan continues to evolve uh, in order that we can meet our student needs uh, based on what's going on with the virus uh, in our schools. Uh, we are, as Carl mentioned, we rely on OHA and Washington County guidance. Uh, we've got bargaining agreements that we have recently agreed to uh, that we're working with. We've got staff shortages that we're trying to address. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, reserves are included in each year to help address urgent and unanticipated needs. Uh, I think I've said it two or three times, there will be ongoing changes based on student needs. And we're gonna give you updates. We're gonna update you in January. We'll update you again at the budget 101 with the budget committee in March. And then again with the budget committee in May. Uh, we'll also put a web, th th there is a web page already up. Uh, we'll continue to, um, we'll put this presentation on it and continue to show updates and changes as we go along uh, to share this information moving forward. And Chair Collette, that's, I believe that's all we have. Uh, thank you, Associate Superintendent Schofield. Uh, any questions from the board? Becky? I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is for uh, Carl and one is for Mike. Carl, the, the question I have, uh, some of those uh, updates that, that you've done with the ESSER money, um, such as HVAC systems and, and uh those sorts of things. Were those things that were on deferred maintenance and we just bumped them up because we needed that to be done to keep uh, our schools safe? Great question. Josh, you popped up at the right time. <laughs> Hi, Becky. Uh, good hey, evening, uh, Chair Collette and board members. So the, um, the larger projects are on a deferred maintenance. Um, they have been identified in the McKinstry report. Um, the, the projects that we're doing up front that Carl talked about, Barnes and uh, West TV gymnasiums, they did not have ventilation to begin with. So they weren't identified in deferred maintenance or on the FCA report. So we are focusing on those uh, gyms up front. Um, but the other gyms that they are, excuse me, the other facilities are identified in that deferred maintenance list. Okay, great. Thanks. And then, um, Mike, um, I have found in the time that you've spent with us, you are a very prudent um, consistent sort of budgeter. Um, I just want to know when you talk to your counterparts and other school districts around the state, are you confident um, that we're going to receive all the funds when we're, I just get nervous when we're already having to plug holes with SIA. Um, you know, I know government means well, but um, we're finding out with rental assistance and other things. Are you confident that that, and then also again, that long-term, our needs for our students are gonna go on much greater than beyond 2023-24. And you know how we spend those funds so that we can still support those students and those much needed jobs that we added. Yeah, it's gonna be critical. I, I feel pretty good, uh, Becky, that we'll receive the funds. OD has done a good job of working with the federal government and making sure that We've laid out processes that work for us and that work for the state as well as the federal government. So I feel good there. I do think uh, you are absolutely spot on that the needs do not go away, even though the staff and the funding do. Um, we'll keep an eye on that from year to year. 
I do hope that we've been prudent. I do hope that um, we, we, this virus gets more and more under control as we go along, as more vaccines become available and, and, and opportunities to run a more normal uh, school year um, will help us. But yeah, we're doing the best we can, Becky. And my friends are all out doing the same thing. Other questions, Karen? So I just wanted to know, like, I have this like aching feeling in my stomach right now with, as I look at the numbers for the class, we're saying we have a shortage of staff. Um, and then we're seeing the cuts from this year to next year of uh, teacher, like classified certified, I mean, certified staff, well, licensed staff and classified staff. And so it seems like counterintuitive that we're going to, we have a shortage and now we're going to get rid of some, but I know we need the money to be able to keep people. So, um, but it just, it's something to note. Aaron, what I, I would add to that too, is we may not be able to hire every position that we've got out there at the present time. We've got a number of vacancies on our classified side and um, it's a revolving door with our certified side as well. So it's, it's a hope that we are able to secure staff for all those positions. But right now we've got, last week we were well over close to a hundred vacancies just on our paraprofessional side. Um, so just difficulty in filling positions. I would just add spot on about, Dr. Perez. What was that? You're just spot on. I mean, you're recognizing the same things we're looking at. Uh, we have open positions. We have uh, one-time dollars. Uh, will we fill them? What will it look like moving forward? We will continue to monitor and adjust, I'm sure. And it makes me think about what our processes will be. Um, something that if our staff is already like feeling tired and exhausted and people are thinking of leaving the education profession for other professions, um, it just makes me think about our process of doing it early and giving people opportunities to see options that they have within our family of BSD um, as we're making those changes and moves. I know it has to do with contracts and all that, but um, the most humane way that we could do it possible for people to keep people, um, you know, engaged and in, in part of our BSD family as much as possible, they've committed to us. And then um, it's just, comp I know it's a complex process. It's not easy, but it's just something that's coming to my mind. Right. And I'm glad, I'm glad it is because Dr. Perez, it's an ongoing issue for us. We want our employees to be with us long-term. The benefit with Beaverton is we are a very large pool of employees. And so we have a very, we don't have a high attrition rate, but we do have a number of staff who choose to leave us for a very variety of reasons annually. Um, this year we hired well over 500 new staff members to the district. Um, we average between two and 300 in a good year. So movement will happen. So for us to have to look to the future, if we can get all these staff to then have to turn around and lay them off, I doubt we'll be facing that circumstance. Other questions from the board? I have a couple of comments slash questions. If you could put up the salary versus non-salary slide. I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate what I see here, which is that as time goes by, we're preserving those dollars, a higher percentage of them are going to salaried folks. And I, I appreciate the, the movement there to try and preserve some of those positions that we know are not, we know that they're helpful during the pandemic right now, but we know they're also things that are just good for kids in general. And that what I see here is, is movement to try and preserve those positions. If you go to the next slide, um, what I'm wondering here as I'm looking at the FTE is because of the large number of vacancies we have right now, are we actually up to the level that we are in the first year in terms of the FTE, right? Because every week that goes by our FTE is actually going down and how might that affect cascading down to the next years? How might that allow us to have like a, a shallower curve in terms of what we're able to do with staff retention? Yeah, Tom, we are not at fully, we're, we're not at this 141 yet, for sure. And so again, these dollars aren't going anywhere. They're committed for ESSER. 
So we will, again, as I mentioned earlier, we will monitor and adjust moving forward uh, to, to take full advantage. Um, do you know, Mike, I mean, in just a relative sense, how far off of that 141 FTE are we? Boy, I'd have to get that for you, Tom. Okay. I, I can follow up. That's, that's fine. Um, I'm doing a little thinking in real time here. So um, it would be great to get the answer there. Um, you know, the other thing that hits me when I look at this is like, you know, I've, I've watched the district for a long time now, and I saw 2012 where we really walked off of a cliff, right? We saw like 356 FTE go out the door in one fell swoop, and that was very, very painful. Um, and I appreciate that this is being stair step, but this, this is still pretty significant. And I just want to highlight how significant this will be for our, our staff and for our students, and just take a moment to really think about that I'm not saying that there's any um, planning on your part that might change that, but just to highlight that for the community. Um, the last question I have is, you know, we're getting, you know, we get constant information out of the legislative revenue office and, you know, they model out what we're seeing from the SIA as the SIA funds recover, how much of some of the loss here might be um, taken care of as those funds move forward and grow. Is there an opportunity to see this curve even shallower if we're able to braid in some of those funds? Potentially, uh, Chair Collette, that, that's out there. That has already happened to some extent. We had some uh, behavioral health and wellness staff that we actually um, had originally allocated in the SIA out here in ESSER earlier. And as the SIA funds uh, went up and we got a better forecast, we moved them out of here and into SIA to help preserve funds here. So does your model then what we're looking at here include that recovery of the SIA? Not completely. I've only looked at the first two years. So we'll see. Year three will be pivotal. I will tell you that um, uh, just last month, the Office of Economic Analysis uh, showed personal income, and it's still up significantly through the pandemic. Um, so uh, that's a good sign moving forward for the recovery. Yeah, one of the analogs I see to that SAA is like, you know, business taxes and in the city of Portland, they just came up way much higher than they had predicted with the business taxes. So I guess I'll leave my final comment is I'm, I'm hoping that that stays that way and that those funds um, come to our district to help shallow this curve even even more. Thank you. Tom, can, I, can I just make a quick comment? I realized that I'm like after you, I apologize for that, but you triggered something with your comment. Is um, recognizing that we have the, Fed, the SIA funds and the ESSER funds, but also my concern is that the state funds our schools at the level, if not more than they have. And I just don't want to lose sight of you lose the potential of losing funding from our state because I think, oh, we're, you know, totally funded, which we are not. That's a great point. And I, we have another biennium where we're going to have to show up and um, really push hard. Agreed. It was, it was tough to get to 9.3, and that was, that was not a current service level budget for us. Well, uh, thank you, as always, Deputy Superintendent Schofield. Really appreciate the, um, the transparency here and seeing what's going to happen. And um, We'll look forward to future updates on this information. Next, we have a budget committee update from, you guessed it, Associate Superintendent Schofield. Oh, I had one more. Uh, you'll see in your packet, uh, just an update. We've extended the, um, op uh, the budget committee uh, advertisement and opening by one month out to um, the middle of November. Uh, we, as you can see, I've summarized uh, down in the text box the number of applicants we've gotten. And I think Director Gard, you've had no applicants in your zone. So um, this is your chance to get out and find your friends and do some recruiting. Um, but anyway, we've left it open uh, till November 19th. So I encourage your friends and neighbors and folks that would love to serve on budget committee, tell them how much fun we are, that it's really a lot of fun. It's, 
it's really a good time and and it's not terrible the commitment it's a few meetings to get them through it um, but just an update to let you know we'll leave it up until November 19th and uh, if you folks could encourage folks to apply that'd be great any questions for uh, deputy or associate superintendent Schofield okay thank you um, next, we have the district COVID update with HR Director Rodriguez and Dr. Hudson and Dr. Sika. Thanks, Chair Collette, Board Member Superintendent Grotting. Um, before we get started, I'm going to share my screen so you'll see an updated version of the presentation that was in your packet. So just bear with me here for a second. All right. So thanks again, everybody. We do have an update, a COVID update, um, just on where we're at with um, all things COVID-19. To sort of kick us off, I am going to display the equity lens again. I won't go through and read all those questions, but just a reminder that the students and families of our district that do identify with the global majority and those students and families who are navigating poverty have been disproportional, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And we just continue to monitor that and to consider that while we're making any and all of our decisions um, throughout our district, but in particularly related to the COVID-19 response. And just a reminder of that North Star, that um, goal of ours is to keep a safe, engaging and consistent in-person full-time experience for all students and for all of our staff. And so that really is the, the target for this and a way to kind of think of what that means practically is um, certainly keeping everyone healthy, free from COVID, but really thinking how do we make sure those isolations and those quarantine numbers are as low as possible um, so that our students are in our classrooms um, to the greatest extent possible. We actually have a relatively short update for you today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our the, the impacts of the vaccine mandate that came through, uh, various health metrics around quarantines and isolations, as well as our testing protocols. Um, talk a little bit about instructional impacts, in particular, the, the how the changing weather impacted our outdoor space and what we did to adjust that. And then we're happy to take, uh, take your questions at the end. And before I move it over or pass it to our uh, Chief Human Resources Officer, just a note, you, um, you had a copy of these slides and like all things COVID last week was, uh, that's just outdated material. So we have some updates in this slide deck that are um, slightly different or maybe even significantly different from what we, what we knew last week when we submitted those to board book. But we tried to designate those changes in red when we could and we'll, we'll try to highlight those for you as well. So um, with that, uh, just some staff impacts by Chief Human Resources Officer Rodriguez. And Susan, just whenever you want me to advance the slides, just let me know. Thank you, Dr. Sika. And thank you, Chair Colette and members of the board and uh, uh, Superintendent Grotting. Uh, my part of our presentation is just to speak about the impacts to staff, both from our vaccine requirements, which um, the deadline came and went last week, and also quarantine and isolation. So uh, last week on October 18th uh, was the day that we needed to make sure that all of our staff are fully vaccinated. That uh, was um, a significant undertaking. I'm happy to report that more than 99% of our regular staff have complied with the vaccine mandate, either through um, full vaccination status documentation or through um, requesting and securing a legal uh, exception from the mandate based on medical or religious reasons. Um, on the 18th, we had fewer than 15 staff members who did not comply with the mandate. Of those, four were non-compliant and um, Let's see, it, I think it was 13 total. So four were non-compliant and nine were are partially compliant. Uh, we have extended that any of our staff members who failed to comply, if they do become fully vaccinated, may be returned to work. So we're working with those nine that are partially vaccinated. We expect most of them back to work before the end of this month. Um, so shifting over from the vaccine requirement and its impact on staff, and by the way, with the talk we've already heard today about our labor shortages, which are significant, 
this um, the fact that we were able to have so many of our staff remain in the workforce as active workers under this mandate was um, wonderful news for us. Uh, so then moving to isolation and quarantine in HR, we also monitor the COVID positive cases on our staff. And so I just decided to do a couple of weeks. And as Brian said, your information in the board book would have been the October 4th through 15th. But since then I've added in the October 16th through 23rd. So you just kind of get a snapshot of our staff situation. On the 4th through 15th, we had zero staff in quarantine and nine in isolation. And um, then that means those are nine staff members who tested positive for COVID-19 and were isolated because of that. Eight of those nine were symptomatic. So one was asymptomatic. And then you can see the next uh, date range, 16 through 23rd, again, seven additional staff members in isolation who tested positive and six of those seven were, were symptomatic. We look for, um, we're always looking for patterns and concerned about where are the exposures happening. More than half of our staff members who have tested positive have tested positive with community exposure and not with exposure at their work site in Beaverton. Out of the 16 that we have during these two date range, two of them uh, it, were exposed at work at their site and uh, all the others were isolated cases um, that may have um, been exposed at work, but not from one another. So we're just looking at those things to keep an eye on safety and, and outbreaks. And um, again, always thinking about our protocols in place and uh, what we're doing to try to keep all of our staff and students safe. So that's what I have for the staff impacts. I think I will hand it off to Dr. Hudson at this time. Good evening, Board Chair Colette at School Board and Superintendent Grotting. I'm here to talk about isolation, quarantine, and testing. So I went um, and took a look at our data um, around what our isolation and quarantine totals have been. Um, that top line there is our elementary. Um, then we have all schools, middle, um, high school and options. And as you can see, we are seeing a significant decline in the number of students overall who are being um, isolated or um, it, entering into quarantine because of close contact. So we're definitely seeing some improvement across the board in our schools. And I think this is really has to do with our focus over the last couple of weeks on making sure that we um, transportation is set up uh, seating assignments for students. We have seating assignments in our cafeterias. We have seating assignments in our classrooms. And really that emphasis on that need to socially distance um, has really, really, I feel like um, helped reduce the number of students we have to um, quarantine because of close contact, as well as the number of students who are testing positive for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So um, here's the like the, the latest update around testing. So um, we are starting testing this week at the elementary level for COVID-19 screening. We had hoped to have started last week. However, just like with everything, there was a supply chain issue ranging from labels and not having enough labels to put on the testing kits to um, OHSU ordering testing kits that were then um, stuck in warehouses at FedEx and couldn't get to our sites. So this week we will be up and running and ready to go with just over 7,500 students who have registered at the elementary level. And we are beginning to start the process for secondary. We sent out consent forms last week for secondary students to participate in the screening program. And as of today, we already have 1,500 students who are going to participate. Additionally, to help support our staff who may um, be experiencing COVID-19 symptoms when they're at home, um, we are, or, you know, on the job. So if I'm a bus driver and I'm experiencing symptoms, we are setting up a centralized district COVID-19 diagnostic testing site. It will open November 8th um, and will be kind of located 
by the loading dock at central office. We have a health assistant who will be managing overseeing that program. And so staff members who are exhibiting primary symptoms of COVID-19, or if they've come into close contact with a student who tested positive um, within three or following three to within three days and up to 10 days of that close contact, they can come in and get tested on site. Um, we will continue to offer our on-site school-based COVID testing for students who exhibit primary symptoms at school as well. And one of the things we need, I, I keep reiterating this, but I know that once we begin the screening program, we anticipate that we will see an increase again in that graph I just showed you of students who may have to be quarantined or those who are isolated because we will be testing students who are asymptomatic. So as of right now, we're only testing students and staff who are demonstrating symptoms, but shortly we will be testing people who are, are students who are asymptomatic. And we will also be testing staff following a close contact within that three to 10 day window. So I just wanna keep reminding people that it's a, um, the screenings are a mitigating measure so we can reduce spread, but it might also have um, unintended consequences of an increase in quarantine and isolation for staff. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, Carl Mead, Steve Sparks and I have been um, going to a wide range of meetings to talk about um, being able to have vaccine clinics within our schools, which we're really excited about, um, or at least nearby our schools. Um, so we're hoping that we might be able to start as early as the week of November 8th. But what I gotta say is our community partners have been amazing from Virginia Garcia to Kaiser to Metropolitan Pediatrics. Additionally, I got it. I need to give some kudos to Dr. Mead and Steve Sparks for really managing how do we navigate these community partnerships in a way that we can um, students and families can have access, um, and that we're meeting the needs of these these families within their neighborhood setting. So, with that, we're looking forward to starting um, a new endeavor with vaccine clinics in in the coming weeks. And I think that is all I have. So it's up to Dr. Sika now. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hudson. Thanks, Susan. Um, last, uh, last one is just some uh, highlights of some instructional impacts. I just want to caution um, the, the impacts to the instructional experience for our teachers from COVID-19 has been extensive. You've heard a lot about that tonight and the challenges it's causing. This is only meant to sort of be the, the latest news, the most recent changes, and certainly not a, a, a comprehensive overview of everything that's going on right now because it's certainly extensive. But essentially, as Oregon is entering into our, our maybe not so nice of weather or our typical fall and winter times, just the amount of outdoor space that we can utilize for more instructional activities or for meal times is just reducing. And of course, that's because of our rain, our temperatures, and then one that we don't always think about. But even if it's a sunny day outside, our fields are probably still pretty muddy and um, just not usable um, in, the, in the conditions that they're in until they dry out. And then that along with just the general staffing concerns of supervision, the further we spread out our students on inside and outside. So throughout our campuses, the more bodies we would need, the more humans, you know, the more adults we would need for supervision. But with that to be said, uh, before I move on, I do want to highlight that our schools are all considering when they still can use outdoor space. So that won't go away at all. There will still be opportunities. Some of those are longer range plans for outside through the use of tents. And some are just so short term times when we do catch some nice weather and we're able to go outside for certain activities, um, we will continue to do so. But I'm really just going to talk about three things, PE, um, music in general, and then meal times. PE, what we, as we come inside, we are still asking um, staff to make sure students stay six feet apart whenever possible. That is more than we would ask in, you know, like a science class or one of our um, you know, one of our other um, instructional opportunities. But the reason for that is just anytime we're getting those heart rates up and the students might be breathing heavier, that does bring uh, an increased risk. So um, while we're always asking our PE teachers to have activities that kind of reduce that, um, if they get with, uh, within that six feet, so less than six feet is when we're approaching the three foot threshold is when we're really asking our PE teachers to have activities that would really limit the movement and limit the amount of physical exertion the students are doing. Now we go into music and this one has um, gone through some changes. A uh, lot of conversations with our teachers, a lot of conversations with the county, 
um, and as well as the opportunity to not only take advantage of some of the data that Danielle has mentioned, we have some opportunity to increase some of our mitigation through um, some air purifiers that uh, that came our way that were, were, were delivered. So again, still trying to have that six feet of space in our music classes whenever it's possible. We're using our auditoriums, we're using our large spaces, um, but sometimes we just can't quite get to that full six foot mark. In our elementary setting, where those schools, um, just by the nature of what we've talked about vaccines, they're still mostly unvaccinated spaces. If you think of all the people, um, we are asking elementary to continue to not sing and to not use wind instruments. And that really is out of, out of an abundance of caution um, as we're really, you know, really patiently, but really looking forward to when, all, when our students at our youngest grades can become vaccinated. And the idea, of course, behind singing and wind instruments is to just, you know, pushing those aerosols, pushing those viruses throughout the space with that kind of elevated, um, elevated breath and elevated wind coming out of those instruments. At the secondary level, um, I alluded to a second ago, we do have an increase in the availability of air filters. So we're able to put some air filters into rooms where students may be getting, um, aren't able to achieve that six feet of space. And so we are going to allow them to do some modified um, singing and modified use of wind instruments, um, even if as long as they're maintaining the three feet of distance. And what that modification is, is that we're asking them to, one, keep masked. So that's not only a mask over the person, but actually a mask over the instrument. And then um, also do that activity for only 20 minutes and take 15 minutes off. And the 20 minutes on, 15 off, the, the 20 minutes parts comes from a pretty well-cited study on the impacts of COVID-19 in choir and music spaces. And the 15 minute break is around the HVAC systems that have been described. It allows for at least a full air exchange um, to go in the room during that 15 minutes of time. And in fact, with our additional air filters, it'll even be more than that. It'll, it'll be, you know, one and a half times of an air exchange. I know our teachers are working really hard to just adjust their lessons, to adapt what they're doing, um, asking a ton of them right now. And hopefully this is a step in the right direction to, to getting back towards a little more sense of that normalcy in some of our classes. Finally, at lunch, you know, um, again, trying to use outdoor space if we can, but much, much, much less is available. Still trying to maintain six feet of distance using those creative spaces. Our students are eating lunch now in areas of our campuses that, that you know, previously we wouldn't allow them to, maybe in hallways, certain classroom spaces. Um, we do want to just mention that um, as administrators and as anyone doing the planning in schools, we accept that burden of responsibility around creative use of spaces. We know that we need to be trying to use everything, um, but there are times where we'll just be uh, under three feet and we, we, will, we will be maintaining that minimum, excuse me, under six feet. We'll be working to maintain that minimum of three feet. And uh, finally, just like Dr. Hudson mentioned, um, we do have assigned seats. We have those uh, seating charts um, at our elementary schools um, during lunch, and those have proven very valuable in reducing the number of students who are quarantined um, if there's been uh, exposure during the lunchtime. So um, a couple of the updates we're having, you know, like I just alluded to uh, about to about to be ready to take your questions, but just what we alluded to, as we the if you remember from previous updates, the the state really has us looking at two things, and those are case rates and vaccination rates. And right now, both are heading in the right direction. Our case rates um, in the state have been, gone down eight weeks in a row. Our case rates in the county continue to decline. Um, the case rates from what Danielle just showed us continue to decline in our schools. All that's great news. Our state and county vaccination rates continue to go up and obviously they'll go up even higher um, in the coming weeks as we start to be able to vaccinate our youngest students. So um, with a little bit of caution, I'll say that, but we're, we're maybe some good news and some hopes to be looking towards some uh, policy changes that can be done safely, but also can um, you know, improve the, the experience for students and for our staff. So with that, um, uh, the, the team here, we're happy to take any questions, do our best to answer them. And if, if we don't have the answer, we gladly find it and get back to you. I think we got a question from Susan. Well, of course, I'm going to say thank you, um, not only for your hard work, but for, oh my gosh, the entire 
BSD staff, um, all the hard work and working through an unbelievably um, hard, hard, more than year and a half. Um, two questions. One, they kind of generated from the emails that we received from um, parents and teachers. Um, one is about um, in terms of because of the rain, it sounds like um, gyms are being utilized for lunches in some schools. And because of that, PE is not being is not able to happen in some schools because PE can't be outside. And so there's some logistic issue there, and I don't know what can be done about that, if that's all principal's choices, but kids are missing physical activity because of that. So I was just wondering if you could address that. And the other one I, I know is a difficult one, but I've seen some emails on this and recognize the fact that there's a shortage of substitutes. So it's difficult for those students, I just, it's more of a comment, and also I just want to clarify this. It's difficult for those students that are in quarantine and may have to be out for 10 days um, to get the curriculum they need and uh, possibly to, to stay up to speed with their classroom work right now because it's difficult for our teachers to support them because they're working hard in the classrooms. And we have not hired, been able to hire substitutes to help to offset that. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Great question, Susan. I'll, I'll happily address both of them. Neither one are easy yeah. situations, but they're, they're good questions. So let's just go to the most recent one first that you were asking about the subs. Um, and Susan, jump in here if I get this wrong, but we've, we have come to agreements um, on, on short-term MOUs regarding substitutes and substitute teachers, which is allowing us to post some specifically to the students in quarantine that you mentioned, some remote only positions, which we actually believe are going to bring some people back into the workforce that may not have been able to, you know, the, at, at their choice, they've been not coming back into in-person, but we do believe we'll be able to find some educators for these remote only substitute positions then they will be able to be working directly with our students who are in quarantine and at least giving them some exposure to, some um, experience with, I guess you'd say, some direct connection with an educator daily um, to just help them navigate into the work. So um, still need to hire everyone. There's still all the challenges going with a, a labor shortage that we're in, but that's the plan. And, and, and the, the plan is moving, not as fast as any of us would like, but it is moving along. Um, as far as PE is concerned, it's so hard to speak globally on this one because every building is different. I don't know of anyone that's actually like canceled PE. I think more likely what's going on is the space allowed for PE is probably too small to have the large distancing. So they're having to have activities that are not what you would think of in PE. You know, they're not running around. They're not, you know exercising like like we want them to they're not getting that moderate level of intensity that's that's put in their standards and to speak globally on it what what we have really asked is for principals to work with their execs to know you know to look at have i utilized all my space as creatively as possible then to come to the team up here to to josh and to myself to our district team are there any other resources we can use but ultimately until we get a high vaccination rate with our youngest students, um, I think the I think we're going to find the um, restrictions to be what that what they are to be restrictive on our practices, um, and we're just going to be looking forward to when we can loosen those up. But um, but great great questions, Susan. And we have Eric, Becky, Bogana, and then Sunita. Okay, so um, I know you guys mentioned a little bit, but like, um, yeah, I think uh, lots of testing is great, but uh, what's your what's your concern? Like you said, if there's a huge waterfall of like asymptomatic people you find, and we have this huge amount of quarantine, so maybe uh, paint the picture for what's going to happen when we start doing that that testing. Well, um, so Eric, thanks for your question. I really think what it looks like is that we might, you know, we had that a big spike of about a thousand students at our highest point that were in isolation or quarantine. Um, so the reality is that we, we will see potentially another spike similar to that. So we'll have more students who are out. 
Um, the hope though is the timing of us starting to do the weekly screening also coincides with shortly being able to administer the vaccines for our little ones, right? Our five through 11 year olds. So I think we are gonna see possibly a little bit of a spike because we're finding those um, asymptomatic students and staff in the system. However, um, then we should see a decline again after the first of the year, once we get more and more students vaccinated. So I think that is where we're gonna really need to be pushing and advocating around uh, making sure our students are getting vaccinated so we can highlight the importance of in avoiding quarantine, isolation, and those kind of things that might impact our students and families. Eric, Eric if I can, I, uh, Danielle just hit it pretty good. I mean, right now, you know, in some areas, our rates are going down and it would be real easy to let off the gas pedal right now, but we're so close to being able to get these kids vaccinations. And if we just adhere to some of the restrictive standards. And I know, I know they're very difficult. They're difficult for our staff. They're difficult for students. But the last thing I wanna see is number one, a major outbreak or one of our students become uh, incredibly ill um, by backing off a little bit. And we're just so close to getting these vaccinations, which I think is going to be the game changer. I think if you look at our high school numbers, and even our seventh and eighth grade numbers, uh, those students that are 12 and up, they're incredibly different than uh, you, you see down at the elementary school. So if we can just hang on here for just a, just a few more weeks, I think we're gonna be in really good shape. Becky? You know, it's really easy for us to focus on still the things that um, can be going better. And, um, but I, I, I would just be remiss if we did not take some time to just celebrate. And that is, we had an HR department um, that went above and beyond to get so many to make sure our staff was educated on what their choices were and why it was best for our community, for our students, for our staff to be vaccinated. So that, that needs to be acknowledged. That was in conjunction with our principals, our building leaders. Um, but that is just remarkable to have uh, 5,500 employees and be down to, you know, four. Um, so, so kudos um, on top of doing MOUs and hiring people and meeting all of these needs every day. Um, but we did what was best to keep our community safe. And I, I just want to acknowledge uh, of that going above and beyond uh, to, to do that. And um, the other thing is, I've like most of us, I've, I've been visiting schools and um, I, I just want to say um, our staff, they, are, they, they had full-time jobs to begin with, but now we are putting them in the public health arena of being contract tracing healthcare workers, um, having to supervise all of the things when they want to be helping our students do interventions and mental health. I mean, they are doing so many different things on top of their regular jobs. And um, I, I just think that we just need to acknowledge how fortunate we are to have such a dedicated staff and district office to make sure to keep all of our students uh, as safe as they can be. Um, um, again, we all have rooms for improvement, but just kudos to all of the great work that you folks are doing during very trying times. Lugana? For some reason, I can't find my unmute button tonight. So I just want to echo uh, Becky's sentiments and um, just to let you know, I'm in awe of all the work that you all have done to continue to keep our students safe in school. That is an amazing work. Thank you. Um, I'm excited about the vaccine clinics and also the availability of vaccines for our younger students. So my question would be around um, uh, sitting assignments. I believe it was uh, Danielle that mentioned something about sitting assignments. Um, I'm wondering if that is also applicable to um, special ed transportation. Do students, um, special ed students also have sitting assignments um, in their buses? So that's one question. And then I have a few questions about um, vaccine compliance by teachers. Um, or staff. So my question would be, um, you mentioned that there are 15 
I don't know if that is correct. 15 staff members failed to comply by October 18. Um, I'm wondering why is it that they are partially vaccinated or they did not get an exemption or the exemption was not approved? I'm just wondering about that. Thank you. Yes. So um, thank you for the question, Ugana. It's actually fewer than 15. We had a, we had some staff members that continued to submit documentation um, even on the 18th. So we ended up with four staff members who are non-compliant. Did not they did not submit proof of vaccination and they did not submit a request for some kind of an exception. And then the remaining nine uh, did submit partial vaccination, one shot, and they, they aren't eligible to work until they complete that series. So that's how that um, shook out. And another piece I didn't mention is of those four, one is licensed, one is a teacher, and three are classified. If I can ask a follow-up question, um, is there any reason to deny an exemption request? We did deny um, some requests. We looked at every document that was turned in to make sure that it complied with the law. And for the requests, we went by the wording of the Secretary of State's rule. So it had to be a request that satisfied the law. In other words, it, if for a medical request, it had to be a licensed medical uh, practitioner that made the case that this, this staff member could not get the vaccine. And then for the religious exemption, it had to uh, outline a sincere religious belief and a connection to how that connected to the vaccines. We did have staff members whose exceptions were not approved. Uh, we didn't keep stats on that. And we were getting these, um, for weeks, because we've been working on this for a couple months. And so, um, you know, in the case of someone who had an exception request submitted and then it subsequently was not approved, uh, those folks would have ended up complying in some other way or being in the people that didn't comply. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Ugana, I'd like to answer your question about specialized transportation. Because our tra specialized transportation is so individualized, all those students traditionally have assigned seating. So it's pretty much set up that way. Um, so it's not really anything new for them in that case. Um, but if they, for some reason, their bus driver was allowing free seating, which um, I don't think happens very often, in this case, they would have then assigned them um, seating on the buses. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. If I can too, also, Danielle, you might want to talk about um, for those people who were granted a religious or medical exception, then uh, it's incumbent upon the district that, that we have to provide some additional measures to ensure that. I don't know, Danielle, you're a lot better at talking about this than I am. So you want to talk about maybe just some of those measures that those folks that the district has to go through to and ensure their safety and the safety of others around them? Yeah, um, Carl Granland through risk management has done a really excellent job of identifying what additional accommodations need to happen for those staff. And he's worked with Josh Gomez. So making sure that those staff members have access to Kate and 95 masks, um, also face shields in addition to their masks, um, so more PPE, PPE has been available for those staff members. And in some cases, we've had to really have a conversation about whether or not we can accommodate that employee in their setting. So for instance, in some of our specialized programs, we have students that really struggle with wearing face masks um, because of their disability. And so if we had a staff member who that was a problem for, that would be some uh, an accommodation that HR would address with them. Susan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, the only the, you you did a great job with some of those um, accommodations and and each of those staff members is meeting in an interactive way with um, our risk manager, uh, our administrator for risk management, Carl Granlin, 
But the one other piece is that we do, we are working with OHA to do weekly screening um, testing for anyone who is, has a, an exception to the vaccination. Um, OHA's, uh, well, Danielle mentioned supply chain issues. So not all those tests have, have been delivered to all of our staff yet, but we're hearing that some are. So we're hopeful that um, we will have those regularly and that will be another accommodation that will help us to ensure that all of our staff and students are kept safe. Sunita. Thank you for doing such a great job. Can't say thanks enough. I know um, it's, a, it's a very small world board, but it means a lot for all the things that you guys are doing. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is I'm sure that the kids and the teachers are very happy that the music, wherever they can, they can go inside the gyms and practice. And um, last time I had checked, you know, those masks for the equipment that you were mentioning, um, supply was a problem. Like some of the schools that asked, they didn't have it or it was on. Is that still a problem? Do all the kids have that? the ones who need it, the equipment masks, because it's a mitigating factor. And I think it would help them if they're practicing inside. Yeah, That's really one. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, I can ask my second question or you can go ahead with that. Well, I guess since I, since I already interrupted you, let me just keep going. Sure, um, okay. to, to, to my knowledge, the, all the bell coverings, the sort of masks for the instruments, um, we've received what we've ordered and, and have them. I can double check that for you. Um, our, our team works with that. And, and Josh, uh, Josh un, unmuted or whatever. So Josh, go ahead and um, go ahead and fill in on that one. Yep. Sunita, we are working with Blake Allen, who's our TOSA on, um, uh, for music and choir. He's put in additional order for the specialized mask for singing and also the bell cover. So we ordered some last year. He's supplementing that with what we're gonna get for this year. And so that's in process, he's working through our purchasing department. Um, we'll get a check on that and get back to you, but that that's in the work for using the extra money to help pay for that. Yeah, because that would help a lot. Yeah, Absolutely, mitigation yeah. strategies. And then the next question is, um, what would be the process of like, um, for COVID testing that's going to start. It's a great thing, but with all the shortages that we have, staff shortages, is it going to be in the school or is it a kit that the kids would get or is it outside the school district? Who will be doing the testing? Can you talk about that a little bit? So I need to start by um, significantly thanking our office staff. So our office assistants and um our health assistants and our nurses and our principals, because this is a really big undertaking. It was, I've been working with OHSU and when we, they first rolled it out, a lot of the conversation was like, oh, well, why don't you add on secondary and we can manage it. And it's, it's not that hard. And um, I met with him, my contact about two weeks later after that original conversation. And he was like, wow, there's a lot more logistics than I actually thought there was. Um, and so that is, it's ultimately, this has been added to the plates of people who already have really overfilled plates. We have been trying to add additional health assistance, but as you've heard tonight, the hiring um, of people to fill those positions just not happening. So um, the way it works is um, every school has a, a distribution date and a pickup date. And so it's Monday through Thursday. And it's pretty, if you think about all 54 of our schools, which includes our programs as well, students will be participating. The only program that's not eligible is Flex Online. And that's because they are an online program and the federal funding does not allow their participation. Um, so if I'm a, um, a Monday or a Tuesday pickup school, the school then goes around and hands out, they have lists of all the students who are signed up um, and they go around and they will take the, a list of the, the classroom list with all the kits. They will take it to that classroom. Those students take the kits home at night. 
the, ne um, the next morning, first thing when they wake up, they spit into the sample um, test kit. Um, and then their parents put a label on the sample and then they put the sample in a biohazard bag. They put a label on it and it comes back to school and we collect them from the students. And then um, the staff package them up and a courier from OHSU comes to pick them up. And then the OHSU calls and notifies the family without in 24 hours, as well as the local public health authority, if there's a positive case. And you know, going through this detail, I just got to reiterate and ask those who are listening to make sure that um, if family finds out their child is positive, that they notify their school immediately because the um, OHSU does not notify the school district of a positive case and we have some lag time from when we hear from the public health authority. So it is a pretty large under undertaking with just, um, and we had, um, I had five amazing staff, actually six amazing staff who made 80,000 packets because it was not, it's not something that was electronic. It had to be like photocopied, double-sided, sent out, and then scanned in and all kinds of things. So um, they have been tremendous and just adding this on to things that they're already being asked to do. But so, uh, thank you for that answer. But I have a follow-up question. I know that you're not BSD is not accepting volunteers except for lunch duties. Is this something that they could ask volunteers to help with. So schools have been looking at whether they can, um, if their volunteers are there at lunch, if they can do some sorting or if teacher like assistants can help with that, or like TAs. The problem is we can't provide any identifiable information to volunteers or students. So they can like be told I need 10 kits from a Dr. Perez's classroom and 20 kits for um, Ms. Timchuk's classroom, but they can't know who the students are because it is protected information. So, um, so trying to figure out how we can leverage people to the fullest extent as possible. Thank you. Thanks. Interesting to hear that Becky has her teaching license and um, I think Karen's next. I have a teaching license too, <laughs> an official one. So, so I, I actually was thinking about like, maybe I should be a substitute teacher for a while, leave my job and just help because it's of the shortage. But um, thank you. I just want to say thank you to our staff. Like the rest of our board was saying, um, I have just seen my daughter participate in music and they participate in PE and just watching um, all the different ways that our staff um, are bending over backwards trying to do what's best for kids. Um, it's amazing to watch and um, brings joy to our students. Um, even we have some students that have um, asked some high school students um, that have explained to us about how difficult it is to be in a choir and trying to prepare for a performance when they have to be outside and inside. And I've watched while I wait for my pick up my kids, I've watched this, um, the music teachers carrying chairs out to have classes outside and then carry the chairs back in. Um, and I, um, as an educator, I can't imagine trying to teach PE without kids moving around or in spaces that are not your typical spaces and getting your equipment out and back. So just want to thank our staff for all that. Um, and thanks to our district staff for all the, the ways that you're mitigating those spaces for everybody. But that's it. And thank you to our middle schools um, staff for all the ways that they're adapting to the new schedules and um, the flexibility that everybody's showing. And I just have a comment here. Um, when we started this school year, um, you know, we knew that we had good mitigation measures and good recommendations, but we also knew we were coming in at a time that was, was almost the same as the peak um, in terms of the numbers for where we were at in terms of this part of the pandemic. And so there's a lot of unknown. And ultimately the way we measure whether our requirements and restrictions and uh, mitigating measures are working is in those numbers. And I just had this moment of intense pride looking at those numbers tonight and knowing that those numbers are a lot of sacrifice and a lot of work on our staff's part to get to this place. 
but that's amazing what they have done because that means that those are kids who can come into school and, and they're not going to get sick. That means that they're spread that's not going to go out into our community and, and hurt members of our community. And that that communal sacrifice that everybody is making right now is not just making a difference inside our schools, it's making a difference for our whole communities. Because communities where that's not happening, there is spread that's going out and there are people who are getting sick and there are consequences for that. But our school community bound together and did a very, very tough thing. And we can see in the numbers that it's working. So uh, it, to me, that's just intense pride. I know that that's a lot of work. I know that, that everything that Karen was just saying about teachers shuttling chairs and adapting spaces and constantly changing, this is a year like no other. But when we get out of this pandemic, there is gonna be a difference that those folks made. And there's gonna be people who didn't get sick and who stayed healthy and are with their families right now because of your sacrifices, thank you. Really mean that. Um, okay, so I think we've got next, uh, looks like Dr. Bridges with uh, Arco Iris and Hope Chinese uh, evaluation reports. Thank you, Chair Collette, members of the board and Superintendent Grotting. Last month, you heard from the principals of the charter schools, and that is outlined in the charter that they come every September and report on components that are outlined in their reports that are specified in the charter. I'm here for the annual site visit and evaluation by the district of the charter schools. That is also outlined in the charter. I'm learning, before I take questions, I just want to step back on um, big picture. This is kind of a big year for the evaluation reports for ARCO EDS in particular. They will be requesting a renewal of their charter in December. And then you will hold a public hearing in January on that request. And then staff will make a recommendation for you to you on whether or not to renew the charter. That recommendation is based on four criteria around financial stability, compliance with the laws, student performance goals, and um, compliance with the charter. This, these evaluations are part of that evidence in terms of whether the school is uh, meeting the criteria for renewal. The last thing I'll say, and I hope, I'm sure you, it came to your attention, the student performance goals, which is for each school, is the performance of students on state assessments, is their achievement greater than the performance of students in dual language programs within our district? When those numbers were run, it was an odd year, both in terms of testing in the charter schools and testing in our district. So our participation rates were very low. I do want you to take those comparisons with a great deal of caution due to our low participation rates. But at the same time, we did not have a student performance evaluation in 1920 because there was no state testing. And so there was some urgency around having at least some student performance data to help determine if the schools were meeting that student performance criteria outlined in their charter. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board. Questions from board members? I think you left us speechless, John. <laughs> Hooray. So what I think I'm going to do is maybe call for um, a 10 minute break here before we head into our discussion items. Um, and let's see, we are at like 823 now. So if folks want to come back at like 833 p.m. And just give everybody a chance to stretch your legs, grab a couple peanuts, have a drink of water and come on back.
All right. Hopefully everybody got some crackers like I did. My stomach thanks me for that. Um, okay, I think our, our next item is we've got um, Dr. Bridges is back with us for the Arco Erie's Charter Agreement. And let's just give it one second, Dr. Bridges, because I think I want to make sure we got all of our board members here. All right. I think I think we're ready for you, Dr. Bridges. Thank you, Chair Collette, members of the board and Superintendent Grotting. Uh, Director uh, Michelle Heron from Arco Edis is joining us for this item. You met her last month when she gave the annual report that I referred to before the break. This charter amendment in Section five of the charter, it specifies the instructional model that the school has adopted for delivering its dual language instruction. And dual language programs can operate on a model where it's 50% in English and 50% in other language, whether that's Spanish or Mandarin, Japanese, whatever that may be, up to a 90-10 model where 90% of the instruction is in the language of the focus of the school and 10% in English. But that is outlined in the charter. For this school year, the Arco Edis Board has approved uh, an amendment request that the, there's an adjustment in the amount of instructional time in each language so that on an as needed basis for this school year, it would be a 50-50 model in grades K through five. The charter already specifies that it's a 50-50 model in grades six through eight. And the reason for that adjustment is, surprise, surprise, pandemic related. So a 50-50 model at grades K through five where needed allows the school to deliver uh, distance learning for those families that are requesting that they don't have, uh, when their students are enrolled at a charter school, they don't have access to online instruction like our students do through Flex Online. And the other reason is, surprise, surprise, uh, a shortage of qualified bilingual teachers. So the change would be for this last year of the charter only, and then it would revert back to what's currently in the charter unless that was negotiated differently uh, this spring for the next charter. So I, uh, Michelle Heron and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have on this amendment. And I do want to apologize. The Arco Edis Board adopted this amendment on August 25th and has notified parents prior to implementing any change in the instructional program. Uh, this should have come to you sooner and uh, I just didn't quite get it done. So I'm bringing it to you now. Questions from the board, Susan and then Ugana. I just um, want to understand because I understand it, uh, Arco Reese is a charter school 
but I, you know, I'm wondering about the CDL. Is that, you know, typical for other charter schools to be um, offering CDL like this? Because um, honestly, I don't think our district, even if we didn't have flex, would be offering CDL this year because of cap capacity issues. So I'm just kind of curious about that. I can take that one, John. Um, it's not something we necessarily wanted to do, but we have, because we have lottery-based admissions, we have families who want to stay in an immersion program, but don't feel safe sending their kids back. And so if they were to unenroll and, you know, homeschool or choose something else, there's a chance they wouldn't have a spot when they decided to return. So we see it as definitely a temporary situation. Um, many of the families who are in CDL would like to have their kids return as soon as they can be vaccinated. So we're actually contracting with an outside provider to offer these services because we don't have enough staff members either. So the follow-up would be that right now, how many students are in the CDL? I mean, so how many of your current students are in CDL? 30. Well, my comment, yeah, okay, thank you. No problem. Organa. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, the issues that prompted the amendment, are they specific to ARCO? Because I don't see that um, Hope Chinese is requesting an amendment. I'm just wondering if this is something that is specific to ARCO. Thank you. I think that staffing crisis, which I know you all have been talking about, hit us particularly hard um, for several reasons. Uh, dual language programs that offer Spanish are increasing in districts around us. And so many of our teachers are being pulled away because we can't compete with the neighboring districts in terms of salary based on our funding model. Our salaries are significantly lower. Um, so we had several instances this year where we actually made hires and then folks reneged on their agreement before the start of the year because they had gotten other offers. Or we made offers and folks, you know, turned them down because they had other better offers. Um, so for us, I think it is a different kind of impact just because Spanish dual language programs are increasing in, you know, availability. Um, this year, one thing that I noticed that has never happened before is that teachers who have a charter registry, which is a special kind of license you can get at a charter school if you come from another country and you're in the process of getting an Oregon license, um, typically that is just allows you to teach at the charter where you're working. And so folks who had that kind of license never got lured away before. And this year, I think we lost four of them. And I'm not sure how other districts are making that work, but, you know, obviously they are. Um, so we found it to be extremely challenging to find teachers. And then even when we found them to hold on to them because of our salaries. Karen. <laughs> Unmute. I'm wondering if, um, our BSD schools that are dual language are moving to a 90-10 model. And I'm wondering, I know that there's a complications for this year. So if, if it was, well, there's a complexity, you said the teacher shortage, as well as having to provide online education for students, for the 30 students, that's a high impact on your, um, on what you can offer in Spanish to your, to your students. Are you looking at moving to a 90-10 model or are you going to keep 80-30 or 80-20 or as you, when you go back? Um, you know, we hadn't, the 80-20 model allows our teachers to have prep time because the 20 basically is when students are getting their English instruction. And because we don't have music or art, we don't really have other ways to provide that pre preparation time for teachers. So we we hadn't been considering moving away from 8020 we we had definitely not been considering you know requesting a a waiver to go to less than that um but with that said you know if we could figure out a way to provide sufficient prep time we're very much in favor of following the research around best practice in dual language or or immersion programs thank you 
Other questions from the board? Becky? Um, I, I didn't have a question, Michelle, until you start talking. I'm, I'm wondering if you and your board have talked about, this sounds like this may be a long-term problem that you have. If you, you had the considerations before that people couldn't get licensed and now they can, um, that you have just much more competition um, for your teachers. Is there a long-term plan how you're gonna address this beyond just this shortage in COVID? Yeah, so two things are kind of playing out this year, but we weren't able to access them quickly enough to get people here in time. So one of them is that we've made a connection with a visiting teacher program that recruits teachers from Spain on a J-1 teacher visa. Um, we found out about them very late. We had actually missed their deadline, so we weren't in the most competitive pool to hire teachers, but we still ended up getting five folks from that program, and they're fantastic. Um, and so we look to expand that program with that particular provider and then also look at finding similar programs that work with schools or work with teachers in South America. Um, so that seems like a really valid avenue for us because when the teachers come, they're on a two-year agreement. So that gives us a little bit of stability, not a ton, but a little bit. Um, it allows us to create a really rich multicultural environment at our school, and we can be a bit more competitive with salaries just because of some of the offsets with the way those folks are taxed um, or not taxed. So that's one really promising avenue that we are planning to expand. And we've actually already started interviewing some folks who wouldn't be eligible until next school year just to get ahead of the curve. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is taking advantage of the provision to have um, people without a teaching degree get an emergency substitute license. And we've moved a couple of our highly qualified instructional assistants into positions where they could take advantage of that to help us with our staffing shortages this year so that we're trying to keep bilingual people in the classrooms as much as we can. Did that answer your question, Becky? Other questions from the board? And we'll, we'll look forward to seeing this in front of us as an action item um, at the next board meeting. All right, next we have the bond, the future bond um, with the executive administrator for long range planning Sparks and our own vice chair, Tim Chuck. So Becky, do you wanna kick us off or you want me to dive in? I, I can definitely kick us off. Um, I appreciate several of you reached out uh, over the weekend and I appreciate that. I, I know when we put things in writing here, it looks like, oh, all of these things have been decided. They, they have not. And so I really appreciated the, the good questions that you folks had. This is just uh, so we can start the discussion. We're going to be coming to you every single month. And there's a lot of things that need to be decided. But if we put some things out there, it gives you some context and some things to think about as we keep uh, moving uh, forward toward making a final decision on, on uh, when we go out for a bond, how much we go out for a bond, and what that bond will include. So with that, I will give uh, leave it over to Steve, who's put together some really good um, tools and has put it in a lot of work um, over the last uh, two years on our long range plan. So good evening, Chair Collette, board members, and Superintendent Grotting. For the record, my name is Stephen Sparks, and I hope you're able to see the screen here uh, for our PowerPoint. What I am hoping to do here this evening is to do a very high-level summary of the long-range facilities plan, which will get us to the what and the why for the project priorities that we've identified in the long range facilities plan. And I'm gonna start with some very basic um, funding and graphics here. Um, we have talked with lots of different people and they're not always solid on how we fund our projects here in the district. And as you can see from our buckets graphic, we do have our general fund, and as you know, that talks about our um, staff salaries and benefits, activities, athletics, curriculum, minor maintenance um, um, 
items that are annual uh, projects within the maintenance department and our utilities. We also have the operational levy that we've um, passed here recently, and that adds up to 300 additional classroom teachers. So our general fund in the operational levy is really the operations of our um, education business with um, our students and our families. Our capital bond, which is our bucket over here on the right, deals almost exclusively with facilities, technology, and transportation. There are some um, functions of um, facilities, technology, and transportation that might be funded out of the general fund, but the bulk of the heavy lifting is done with, through our capital bond uh, funding. Within the capital bond funding, and we're gonna go into this in a little more detail as I go through the slides, you can see we deal with educational programming, what's um, included in that bucket, facility condition, which is perhaps the biggest bucket, and you can see what's there. We also have enrollment and capacity, and we have our support bucket as well. So these, um, for example, we have new school offices at Aloha, uh, Cooper Mountain, and Westview identified as um, in that support function, which, could perhaps be in the facility condition um, bucket or even in the educational programming, but we put it in uh, the support bucket. So our long range facilities plan, which we adopted um, earlier this spring, we've done an enormous amount of work, which has not been done before in the district. And um, you can see here the data sources that we used in developing the long range facilities plan. We have the McKinstry report, which is our facility conditions assessment. We have um, seismic assessments of every um, facility, every building in the district. We also have done our regular uh, um, uh, enrollment forecast through the um, Portland State Population uh, Research Center. And we also did the 2017 future study, which is a new um, 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 study to the district. And as you um, saw in the buckets before, those are our uh, major areas of consideration in the long range facility plan. And a key component of the facility plan is to identify a funding strategy to um, address the facility needs for the district. And in that long range facilities plan, we had an op two different options. Option one would raise about $325 million. And that is the option we've talked about before where we would go to the voters and ask the voters to, in essence, renew a um, bond that is expiring. And it's basically uh, re, you know, retaining the actual assessment per assessed value, uh, property value. So there is no change on the property taxes. It is a new uh, tax, cut, but it's just a renewal in essence of an expiring bond. The second option is to um, not only ask for the renewal, but also an increase of 25 cents per thousand dollars of assessed property value. And you can see that would raise approximately $720 million. So you see here a um, summary. And again, this is not um, going into the weeds of every single project that we're identifying. But in the long range plan, here we've identified the funding priorities under option one and option two. And I wanna bring your attention specifically to the purple text in the bottom left corner. The uh, um, estimates that we have created are temporal in that they have been identified um, at around the beginning of COVID. We have lots of different um, factors that are influencing costs right now. So we want you to look at these, um, um, these funding amounts as rough orders of magnitude. There will be far more refined estimates as we go along, but for our discussion purposes right now, this is what we're uh, our operating assumptions. So moving along, 
So in our educational programming uh, bucket, we've noticed, we've, we've learned that there are um, schools that are below the um, targets for square footage per um, student in each classroom. We also know that there are improvements that we need to make at our schools for preschool, for physical education and special education. And when we look at the district as a whole, we have um, 12 schools which emerge as um, um, highly um, um, impacted by um, poverty or um, other uh, language challenges, things like that, which um, are not necessarily found in other schools within the district. So what does educational programming mean? You can see here, and I will not do my favorite thing and read um, the slide to you, but you can see here the types of things that, um, are, that we've learned from our teaching and learner, learning partners and the principals at um, each of the schools. We interviewed every single principal. And you can see here that there's outdoor learning improvements, and that's particularly the um, covered play areas, uh, also playgrounds. Uh, we have physical education. So there are, um, you were talking with Dr. Um, Bridges about um, um, Division 22 and the requirements for, um, you know, the standards for instructional time and PE is one of those um, factors that we need more gyms at um, a number of schools. We also have, as I mentioned, uh, special education improvements and pre um, kindergarten as well. So again, the perhaps the largest bucket is our uh, facility conditions. We've talked a lot about Raleigh Hills and Beaverton High School. We also have a number of schools here that are in our worst category for um, seismic. And our deferred maintenance is particularly large and we have it, it estimated at $610 million. So the slides that are on the right are going to be familiar to those members who looked at the uh, long range plan over the past year. And you can see here in terms of Raleigh Hills, it is one of our um, um, oldest buildings. It is um, perhaps the poorest performing um, building in terms of seismic and certainly um, the worst performing uh, facility in terms of the uh, infrastructure that are that is in the building, so the assets that are uh, in the building. Beaverton High School is also one of the poorer performing schools, and again, another reason for us to target and prioritize uh, the replacement of Beaverton High School. And it, also in, um, targeted for replacement is the Allen Boulevard Transportation Facility. You've heard me uh, before uh, say that the lifts in the bays are um, extremely old and some are not even operating anymore. So this is a facility that truly needs to be uh, replaced to keep our buses operating and um, moving our children around um, safely throughout, particularly the southern part of the district. Although this support facility does support buses that tra you know, travel all over the district. You've seen, um, you've heard us talk about modernization. Again, this is where we talk about our maintenance, our seismic, our security upgrades. We have kitchen upgrades um, that are needed. We also have just modernization of the buildings in terms of replacing carpet, doing um, um, wall projects, um, improving the AV, um, lighting, um, doing uh, windows that are um, actually nice, big and bright and bring that natural light in. So the, this modernization is you know, a particularly important um, um, bucket for us because it, it will apply all over the district. In enrollment and capacity, um, we do have 
um, capacity issues at a number of schools. And you can see those right there. We've identified that we want to bring um, additional classrooms to um, Soto Elementary and Stoller Middle School and Oak Hills. Oak Hills is not in a high growth area, but they are in an area that is refilling uh, it, its enrollment pretty consistently. And it's time to um, add more classrooms and get rid of the um, portables that are on that uh, school site. Also with um, capacity and enrollment, we have to consider um, boundary adjustments and possibly the consolidation of schools because our district, as you've um, heard many times before, our district is um, not growing in certain areas of the um, district. In fact, it's contracting for different reasons, which we can go, to, go into at a, another time. But that is another um, factor we need to consider when looking at enrollment and capacity um, issues at our schools. So again, um, this is the summary of um, where we are proposing to um, place the priorities for funding in a future bond, both in options one and options two. And um, right here is the end of my presentation, which is to you know, hopefully in, um, have a discussion with the board to talk about, well, what size of bond should we as a district you know, um, move forward to propose to our voters? What election date should we propose to our voters? And then what is the duration of the bond? Now, the duration is important in terms of when does um, this bond expire and therefore a future board consider putting on a subsequent bond at a future date? Should that be in um, a presidential election cycle? Should we avoid a, a presidential election cycle? Um, should it be in November? Should it be in May? So those are the types of questions that we'd like um, for you to begin this discussion. We're not asking you to make a commitment tonight to say we're going to do one, two, and three, but we want your, um, at least your preliminary um, gut check decision and that will help us move forward in coming to you at, uh, uh, at, our, at your next meeting with more information and um, action for you to pursue. So with that, um, I will stop right there. Questions from the board? Comments to the questions that have been posed? You know, I'll, I'll just start with a question. Um, are we gonna be seeing some polling data because these are these are great questions, but I, I think polling data would definitely help me to be able to answer them beyond the gut check level. Yeah, uh, Tom, we're um, working with um, Strategy 360. We're meeting. Uh, we have weekly meetings. Um, our goal right now is to be going out in November um, with some polling questions, and um, then having that information back to the board um, by, by hopefully our December meeting. Ugana and then Susan. It's more of a confirmation based on all the information that we have received. I just wanna confirm with option one, um, it's already approved by voters. We don't need to court voter approval. Is that the case? Because that's what I read from one of the uh, reports. So that's not the case. No, so what, what is happening right now is a bond is scheduled to, a, a, a previous bond is scheduled to um, come off of uh, property owners' um, tax bills next year. And what we would propose under option one is go to the voters and ask them to approve a property tax of, I believe it's 21 cents per um, um, assessed property value of $1,000 of assessed property value. And that would result 
in a tax bill um, for the property owners that you don't see any change. In essence, it's a renewal, but it is a new um, bond. So it will go for 20 or 30 years. And it would raise about the $325 million. Okay, so because I know that I read something that says already approved by voters, then that's misleading if that's the case. It, the, the rate has already been approved. We would just be asking them to continue it beyond the eight, the eight years. It, it was approved eight years ago, but it expires um, this, next, this next year. So we have to ask, we can't just, just because they approved it once, just assume that we still have to go back out and ask the voter to keep that same, it would be the same rate and just continue that improvement. Or we can decide to ask for more money and get that uh, additional money of what we're talking about that we get. So yes, they did approve it eight years ago, but it expires. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Karen, and then Sunita. Yeah, some of the questions I had for Becky last night was around, um, so there's two options. And like Ugana, you were saying, the rate would be the same for bond, for the first one, but we're asking voters, is it okay to keep it the same rate or do we wanna add 25 cents? And adding those 25 cents would allow us to get more, um, more, um, <laughs> More money. More, more uh, I can't even think. I'm sorry, my brain's trying to turn off. More, change, more buildings fixed or like more seismic adjustments for our, for our, for our buildings, for them to be safer. Um, that's where that was coming from, I think. And um, yeah, so I, I appreciate that this is, these are two options. It's not something we're going to take it to our communities, I'm thinking, and like Tom was saying, and get input on what would be important to them. Um, and it's great that we have these reports that allow us to really pinpoint which um, buildings um, need the most seismic supports or which schools need certain repairs, which is really helpful. And it's some concrete data that we can use to make really informed decisions. So I really appreciate that we have that and that we're gonna get input from our community. But thanks for all the work on this. Sunita? Yeah, this is very helpful. Um, so when we go for polling, do we ask whether we will, because the 325, they've already approved the rate. So there's no polling required for that. Is that true? Or we're just going to ask whether they'll be okay with the 25 cents or what would be a polling question? Well, it's, it's, you know, all of us as voters, we're all, you know, voters, um, it's, it's always easy to just ask someone, uh, you don't want your taxes to go up. Well, would you like to just keep, you know, paying the same rate? It's, it's like anything we pay for. Is it easy when you're just selling something that's the same price? So we're just asking you to continue this bond for another four years, another eight years, another six years, whatever it is that we, we ask for. It's a little bit different sell that we have to make the case that we don't just want to have the same taxation rate, we're asking you for an increase. And that's what polling, and there's nothing magical. We could ask for a 50 cent increase. We could ask for a 10 cent increase. It usually goes up in 25 cents, but there's there's nothing that says it has to. So it's it's just, it's a psychological thing with the with voters when you look at your, your, your property statement, when it's something that's just staying, we're not gonna raise your taxes. We're just asking you to continue what you're already paying we're already used to paying but if we're asking for an increase we are we're asking you to not only pay what you've already been paying but a little bit more to get this for 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 the money so it's, it's yeah. and it's, and when we look at the numbers i mean there is a lot of need the mon the need for the money is there you know as you start seeing each and every building and the space and yeah it's there. <laughs> um, we, have, think, we have over a billion dollars in need. I know, I know. I mean, it's, it's um, when you start looking at a deeper, at a deeper level, you realize how much the need is. And the 25 cents to me doesn't seem that much, but it's good that we are taking the community involvement because everybody has their opinion about it. Um, 
also I had asked a question about the the school relocation for the 10 million is that the Aloha High School is that what you guys are talking about there the that would be for Aloha High School's front office the front office at Westview High School and the front office at Cooper Mountain Cooper Elementary Mount. okay. yeah all right thank you thanks for clearing that and the slides that you showed today were a little bit different than what we got in our package, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can, we, can we get that slide? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. And again, you guys, we're going to continue to talk about that and, and things are going to change. This was just so we can start having the, dis the discussion about this. And Becky, can I put a point of clarification out there? And this, I know it may sound ticky tacky, but if we have our community listening, we need to, when we're talking and referring to our existing tax base, we have to continue to say estimated, yes. no tax increase. We yes. have to say estimated. That is key to all of us because we don't want them coming back at you as board members and say, you promised on this date, I watched it. <laughs> You're exactly right, Carl. Thank you. I, I feel like Carol's in the room, Carl. Uh, Ugana. Thank you. I just want to ask all my questions and be sure that we are all on the same page. Now, with all the information that have been provided to us, we can see that there is a need in the district. And we can also see that uh, uh, with all that information, we need fluidity to be able to execute all these capital projects that we have need of in the district. Now, as a board member, I am privy to that information. Is that something, because I don't know how we're going to sell this to voters to let them know that their tax, assuming, assuming we choose to go with option two, um, making that sell to voters to, to let them know their tax rate is going to increase. I don't know how we're going to sell it. I'm wondering, are they going to have access to the information that we have access to and be able to make that informed decision whether or not to vote on option two or option one. I mean, we are getting all this information and we're able to, for me, I, I'm also a voter, but what I have, what I do see, I see that we have need, right? And based on that, the, the option two would give us that fluidity to be able to handle and take care of all those needs. But our voters out there are gonna be able to see what you're showing us and be able to make that informed decision. Thank you. Yeah. So Ugana, you know, we, we will, we will do the poll and we're, we'll try to be making our case in the poll of what different options and, and we'll say in the poll, if you, you know, if you, if you pay for this much, this is what you're going to get and, and try to see what kind of phrasing is it, is it technology? Is it seismic? Is it, is it security? Is it, you know, there, we'll, we'll look for messaging in our polling, but that's where, the, the staff has done a great job putting together all of this information, but it'll be our responsibility as a board once we vote for this, that the campaign starts. And that's where you educate our voter, voters and make the case of why we need this money. Now, before we, we go to that point, we're already going to have agreed whether or not we're going to keep it at the same rate, the estimated rate or the estimated uh, increase. Um, we will have made up that mind and we'll have exact bond wording of this is what it's going to pay for. But then the campaign starts of us making our case to get the voters. And that, that will be our jobs in going to PTO meetings and chamber meetings and CPO meetings and uh, anywhere where, you know, uh, Eric go, loves going door to door and giving out dog treats and, and getting, I mean, all of us will be using all of our techniques to educate uh, our public and we'll have list, you know, we'll have town halls and we'll be doing outreach to newspapers. I mean, that's where the, we'll be, we, the board will be doing the campaign to educate the voters so that they know what they are choosing and why they're investing in the school district. Thank you. Just marketing. Yeah. Marketing, that's just right. Marketing 101. Just, a, just as an anecdote, when we were um, doing the over 40 um, um, engagement events for the Long Range Facilities Plan, we presented options one and two to the community. We did provide um, detail and the results, and again, this is not a scientific survey, but the people that we spoke with um, it was a substantial um, um, vote in favor. It was in the 80% 
of people who participated that supported the increase because once they listened to the presentation, they understood much better on the uh, need in the district. So I hope that dog treats are not part of our plan. Um, <laughs> But I also see that David has a comment. Uh, he wants to complicate things, which he often does. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> but I think, there is, I think there's some good, important clarification for you here. There, there are three things that end up on the ballot from the school board perspective, right? One is you all running as school board members. You're on a ballot. There are two tax pieces that are on the ballot then. One is the local option levy, which funds teachers in the district. Right. And for that, voters approve a rate. They approve a tax rate, the dollar twenty five per thousand mill rate that then collects however much that dollar twenty five collects. OK, then the other thing they vote on is a capital bond. And that's what we're talking about here. And a capital bond is different. They vote for an, a debt package, essentially. So we would seek authorization for either 360 million or 720 million or some other number. And we estimate that the tax rate in order to collect that amount would be X. That's why you had Dr. Mead and others and Mike Schofield was texting me, it's estimated. This is an estimate. And you heard that with Carol Samuels, it's an estimated rate because the voters are voting for a debt issuance, essentially a debt package. Now the question of, the voters already authorized or whatever, you can almost ignore that. We're done with ACMA and with the exception of a tail on a few projects, the previous bond expires. There is no further construction projects to happen. So we, we are asking the voters for something in excess of a zero dollar amount. The default is zero. If the voters do not vote, there will be no new bonded indebtedness issued by the district. So we are, we are looking at packages in excess of zero that we think help address the need. Now we think that there is need. And so we would think that it doesn't make a lot of sense to ask the voters for something less than what we estimate an extension of the current rate would be. And that's the 300 plus million dollars. But we think it's worthwhile to consider what would a slight increase in that estimated in, um, uh, tax rate be to get to that. $720 million. That's essentially the frame of the conversation. And I just think it's important to understand as we talk about rates and not rates and what the voters are approving and not approving, et cetera, I think that's important. And then the last piece, as Becky said, the sales job is the campaign that will be run asking for a yes vote on a measure. And at that point, once something's on the ballot, the institution as a public institution can only fulfill an educational role, we cannot advocate for a position. You as elected board members, however, are free to advocate for a yes or no vote on the ballot. So I think all those pieces. Oh, well, thank you guys, because that was that was really good detail. And that's what's so hard about going out for a poll, because there's a whole bunch of variables in there. Um, and maybe next time um, we can have uh, Stephen might give us a little lesson about how you go out for a bond sale and that can change the amount of money that comes in and 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 knowing how we we paid for that um, last time but are there any other questions with just these big picture things that we put in and and then next time I'll be reporting to you guys about polling can I ask a question oh, it's a quick question um, so what like all of us board members we are in some committees or some organizations when we go and talk once it's in the ballot, we cannot take a staff member with us to explain. Is that what I'm hearing from David? Can We will advocate, but can the staff member come in and present the need or something? You can't yeah, do that. No, so, so yes, um, if invited by an organization, the staff can go and factually describe what the measure would, would purchase. Right. So, so, so that's okay. that was my the campaign season, if you will, the district would likely produce materials and distribute uh, possibly a mailer and certainly social media feed um, it, the unbiased factual information, uh, you know, 
This is the rate we're estimated. This is the things that would be, per- would be projected to purchase with it, that kind of thing. Be very dry and factual. We could probably dig up some examples from the last campaign to share that with you, what that would look like. Not quite as dry as the graphs you're seeing on, on page here, but um, you know, pretty dry stuff, right? So the thing, really is, the thing in- is that, that this is, first, like you're saying, you know, it is dry. Yes, right? Yeah. It's dry, but it is taking, uh, for me, even though numbers are my business, you know, but still like it has to, I had to see this two or three times had Carol give us a talk to actually start making sense, you know, and seeing the need. So I can understand when the voters see for it, it would be nice to have someone or, or, or some material that would just really nicely combine it and show them, okay, this is the need. This is what we are asking for. So please vote kind of a thing. So Something this, make it easy I, for them. I would I, add. I, so I was going to say, ahead. I think Sunita, to answer your question, I think what you're asking is board members would have all the technical assistance they required. They just would not have the district advocacy, but you would have all the technical assistance and having a staff member maybe there with you to be able to answer those technical questions. Yeah, I think that that answers my question. Thank you. That helps. So, um, we have an enormous amount of um, detail that we can share with um, any interested party to understand the, the need. The materials here tonight are just a scratching the surface of, you know, the types of things that we can bring to bear, um, you know, in terms of like the McKinsey report or the um, seismic report, um, as you know, there are hundreds of pages that people can get lost in. So in terms of developing information, which is dry and informational, um, we can certainly um, have have that. And frankly, I could see a, like a town hall of just kind of the presentations that we did during the long range uh, facilities plan of here's the district's need. Yeah, I, I don't think we would want hundreds of pages. We want to make it simple. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So Sunita, I think, understand. Yes. as all of you know, uh, we have an amazing colleague, Shelly, and I promise you, if <laughs> she will be phenomenal once she gets her hands on all this t- on this information to be able to make it for our consumers and our, our populace to be able to have an understanding of it. Um, Shelly will be an integral part of this. And I promise it's probably going to be a video or two out of this as well. You know, knowing Shelly. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. And I would just add that when you poll, you don't just poll to find out what the taxation rate is. You poll messages mm-hmm. and you poll a simplification of everything that, that has been presented to us and what is the most impactful simplification of that. So one of the things I'll be looking forward to seeing is not just the taxation rate, but what messages really resonate for our voters. Um, any, any other questions from the board? Comments? You know, I just want to take a moment and appreciate our facility staff because we're sitting in a pretty amazing spot where we have these incredible reports. A lot of districts do not have the resources we have right now. The McKinstry report, the seismic report, the future studies report, the long range facilities plan. Each one of those is an incredible amount of work and planning. And you guys have set it us up so well for this bond. And that, you know, just... I haven't been on the board that long, but this is this that was not the case when I started on on the on the school board. That has been a lot of work that's happened over the last couple of years. So thank you for that. That's incredible. Um, you know, I, I can't commit to any sort of like level or anything I'm looking at right now because I think that polling data is really important. But a couple of things I'm thinking about at a gut level. When I think about this bond, I don't think about it in isolation. I think about what path and what trajectory does it put the district on over a long period of time, the 10, 20 year mark, because our needs are not needs that are gonna get taken care of in a single bond. They are our long-term needs, right? And when I look at that, I can't imagine going out for a bond and not taking care of Beaverton High School. I can't imagine putting that off for another uh, cycle. That seems very impactful to me. I'm also looking at it and I'm saying, you know, the seismic need is so important. 
um, and that we get there so that we can say every kid is in a school that is seismically safe. We can't say that right now. And we've, we've got work to do to get there and that's urgent work. So again, if this bond were to not, to basically do about half as much work as what, is what we're seeing, because we're seeing like a, basically a twofold increase between the two different taxation rates, I would be very concerned about the long-term trajectory there as well. Um, ultimately, I think the voters decide and that's where the polling is important. But one thing I would ask when we go out for the polling is that we don't poll at just that quarter rate, but maybe we look at some 10 cent increments upwards as well. Because if we can do 25 cents, maybe we can do 35 or maybe we can do 45. And I'm interested in what that would do to our trajectory. And on the alternate, if we can't do 25, maybe we can do something like 15. So understanding things in a little smaller chunk, because what we do right now will have such a large impact over our trajectory 10, 15, 20 years from now. So th those are my comments, but obviously you've got to see the data to be able to say, hey, this looks good or, or this plan looks, is it going to work? Okay, so Tom, I'm just going to um, say that um, we're not going to have another board meeting before we go out for this poll. So um, I, you know, as you know, there's only so many questions that you ask on a poll and you're trying to get a whole bunch of things done in a poll. So what, I, without doing a vote or anything like that, if someone can just, if, if I could just get a general idea of maybe what we're thinking about, I know specifics, we want to see polling and, and we will definitely share those things before it goes out so that the board is aware of what uh, is going, is, is going out, but is after now two, three discussions about this, are we, is there kind of a general awareness that we're leaning more toward the May toward rather than November? Is there, is it, is there anyone against strongly has strong feelings about going out in May? We should be asking that question to you, Becky, because you're the one who's putting in so much time and effort. So you tell us. So what you're saying, whatever I say, you guys are all going to fall in lockstep. And, uh, <laughs> we'll help and you. I mean, I have nothing against me, but we will help you. You tell us. <laughs> I think Carol made the argument. And I think there's enough argument that I am, I am co comfortable. You know, I would like more time, but I am comfortable. And I think it is the right thing for the Beaverton School District to do to go out in May. So we're in, in general good about that. And am I getting kind of just the general feel that most of us would like to have more money to spend on the things that we think our students need uh, rather than just going for just the uh, estimated renewal? Yes. Is yes. that a general kind of, okay. So that's that, those are the kind of things I'm gonna uh, keep working with. with um, and if, and if you if something comes up and you have stronger opinion, but we're we're going to do this out in the public and and we are making these. But if you as an individual board member have some um, trepidation about any of the things we're talking about, please, please let me know so we can discuss it and get staff or whatever you need the the resources. But um, the next the next biggie, we'll have a lot to talk about. It will, will be after the poll. And Tom, I will. Uh, work with Strategy 360 and make sure that uh, folks are aware of some of the, the questions that we're going to be putting on the poll. Yes, yeah, Susan. I have a clarifying, it's a quick clarifying question, Becky. The poll is going to have questions about the bond, but then there might be one or two questions that are like a general question about the school district and the vibe people have about the school district right now, or is it just strictly bond questions in the poll? I, you know, I, let me get back to you on that. Okay. I, I don't, you know, what's going to, what's going to matter, Susan, is um, there's a whole thing about how long a poll is, how long you can engage people in a phone call, how much you're getting from a cell phone and you're trying to get a cross section of, of folks, um, you know, the, the timing of it, because a poll at the best is a snapshot. And, you know, it, as long as we're, things are going well with COVID, but we know that people have strong feelings about our district and they sometimes, this is the only thing way that they can. So let me, let me, before I say how many questions and what they will be about, let me get some cost estimates and, and the timing and how many we're going to go out to poll that kind of point, thing. Before. Point well taken. Thanks, Becky. Yeah. And thank you, Becky. I know you're going to be leading the charge on this and we're lucky to have you. I saw you in action on the last levy and um, that one by record margin. So if this doesn't pass by the same margin, we're going to be disappointed. Yes, Tom. <laughs> the bar is set high. 
a, a levy is a little bit. <laughs> But yes, thank you very much, and I and you and this will this will be a great adventure. All Thanks, right. Steve. And yeah, and uh, uh, Steve, make sure to share that um, the the buckets that you had there, uh, the Home Depot portion, which is awesome. I'm I'm sending it to Diana right now. Awesome. Um, okay, I think next we have the Behavior, Health, and Wellness Project team charge um, with uh, Dr. Hudson, Executive Administrator for Student Services. Good evening, school board. Great to see you again. Um, my conversation is a little bit less rousing, but I will go ahead and um, get ready to share my presentation with all of you. So hold on one second. Okay, so um, I am here tonight to talk about the Behavioral Health and Wellness Project Team Charge. So um, the Be Beaverton School District reviews and updates its curriculum um, practices based on board policy, Oregon state statutes, and um, administrative regulations. One thing that's interesting is the state of Oregon has not um, fully moved forward with a social emotional learning or behavioral health and wellness adoption. There's many recommendations on their, um, their website, but haven't ever really moved forward with saying we want to, as a state, we need to adopt specific materials um, in schools. So, but in our district, we've decided that we want to move forward with doing a full K-12 or K-21 through behavioral health and wellness adoption. Um, we feel that it's in you know, it's important that we have a plan to address our needs around behavioral health and wellness, which you guys have seen the de definition many of times before, but we want to make sure that if we're going to really hone in on this definition, what are we going to teach um, to? What are our targets? How are we going to teach that? Who's going to deliver it? And how are we going to assess student needs and growth? So um, really our rationale is we have a declining, um, you know, many years of declining mental health. We've had a global pandemic. We've had a racial reckoning in response to enduring white supremacy culture. And we really need to uh, prioritize the mental health and emotional well-being like never before. And I think we heard that tonight. Um, loud and clear. So these, um, the efforts of behavioral health and wellness is really about reducing barriers to learning in order to increase opportunities for student engagement. So um, there are two um, committees that are, become part of an adoption process. Um, and the board here tonight is, we're talk, going to be asking you to charge a project team, which is the project team reviews curriculum and practices in behavioral health and wellness. And they will ultimately as a team make curriculum, professional development and adoption recommendations to the school board. The project team includes staff, students, community members, as well as a school board member. Since last year, we have actually had a cadre um, working to really define what we believe the best practices in behavioral health and wellness is, what our philosophy is, and then ultimately moving, that, that team will start looking at instructional materials that are, that align with the best practices that we've, um, identified as a team. And then we will be taking these recommendations to that project team. Ultimately, the cadre is filled with professionals in this work, but they're going through it and taking it to people who are actually going to be doing the work, whether it's um, the staff who will be delivering the instruction, the students who might be receiving or participating in it, the family members who are impacted by behavioral health and wellness, as well as our school board. So having making sure our school board is knowledgeable about what is happening in our schools in this specific area. So with that, what I'm asking tonight is that you consider for our next um, board meeting to approve the following resolution that the school board would direct the superintendent to form a behavioral health and wellness project team for this school year. 
um, to review and to facilitate the program adoption. And I'm asking that if there is a school board member who is interested in participating in the project team, that they let Chair Colette know um, so that um, once this charge is issued and we go out to um, have staff and students apply for the project team and community members will know which board member will be involved. All right, and then I'm gonna stop sharing. So with that, do you have any questions? Questions from the board? One thing I'll put out there is I think at the same time or around the same time, we're gonna have an arts adoption. And I also think we have a multilingual adoption happening at the same time. So there's gonna be multiple opportunities for folks to serve on project teams. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's that time of the school year, project team time. And one thing I do want to highlight is when we talk about behavioral health and wellness, it'll include our tier one, tier two, tier three, and special ed supports, but it also will include drug and alcohol um, prevention, intervention, and post prevention. So it's pretty massive undertaking, but I think it's um, one that is exciting and um, has definitely been needed for a very, very long time. Danielle, I have one question. Um, I know a lot of the cadres, I remember you have like um, like the health cadre or science cadre, you have some learning targets, but this one seems a little bit more open-ended, right? Because there's not really defined targets. So maybe guide me through that process of how you're going to get to somewhere that's, you know, not mandated by Oregon Department of Education, et cetera. Yeah, it's been, um, it, we had, um, it, the discussion around learning targets was um, a really challenging one for the cadre. Um, we currently in the district have behavior learning targets. And so that's what we started with. But as we started reading um, the learning targets, what we found is they are relatively subjective. They are really um, based in some very uh, Eurocentric ideas about how students should learn and behave in the classroom. And we felt like they are pretty open to some misinterpretation or just really one-sided views of how students should learn. So in our conversation, we're actually moving more towards a growth goal model where we're looking at um, the Castle framework and the social justice frameworks that exist um, out in some other states. And we're gonna be looking at setting, what do we want students, you know, what when we think about um, the BSD graduate, what kind of characteristics do we feel are important and essential for career and college readiness? But then ultimately the students will be the ones who identify which uh, growth goals they're gonna work on and they will be the ones who are assessing themselves versus a teacher assessing the student because we feel like there's a lot of ownership that needs to be taken. And we feel like through some of our behavior learning target work, we've actually continued to disenfranchise our students. So we're hoping to move to more of this student focused and student measured um, approach around our growth goals. And then whatever those goals are that we align with, then the curriculum materials would need to teach those skills for the students. Karen? Yeah, that last part that you're saying, Danielle, was uh, um, spoke to me in the sense that um, students don't enter um, neutral spaces and when they enter our buildings, there's lots of different pieces that are occurring. So it's not just on the students. And it made me think about our policy work, our policy group that's looking at like redoing the student handbook and our discipline policies and restorative practices and um, all those add to the mental health supports and, and actually kind of, to me, in my mind, they go together because, um, and even the Paul, the AOR or the, gosh, I'm sorry, my brain's true, but also the work that's been done on the all students belong and how students can report and staff can report that all goes together to the mental health of our students. And so, um, if students feel safe and, um, free of hate and bias and, um, and, and our staff knows how to respond and has the tools to do restorative practices or to um, has a handbook that actually speaks to the whole student and not in a punishing way. Um, that'll also support your work. So it's not a vo in, in a void. It's actually kind of goes together for me. 
Yes, so through this work, we have um, a bunch of different buckets. So we have um, staff professional development bucket that has two tiers. One is um, about why sell, why behavioral health and wellness, what is trauma-informed care practices, kind of that basic foundation. But then there's the PD about how do I deliver the curriculum? How do I instruct students, right? So staff, we're looking at that. Then we're also looking at the student bucket of what do we need to do to help meet their growth goals and how do we instruct them? And then we have the parent piece. So one of the big areas that we have been lacking in, the, in our uh, work specifically around behavioral health and wellness is around parent engagement. So we also then have a strand where we're looking at the needs for families. So whether or not it's um, behavioral health and wellness strategies in their home, parenting strategies, um, is it restorative practice in the home? How do you, you know, repair harm with a sibling or with your own parent. Those are kind of all these things that we'll be looking in. And then you layer on the different areas from just, um, you know, uh, advocacy around um, self-regulation, around drug and alcohol, those all come into play there. Other questions from board members? Yes, one more. The reminded me also of the like the drug and alcohol policies that we have um, and how we heard, you know, from our Aloha High School group that talked that spoke to us about how our policies are actually not equitable in some ways and that how we can improve and that will also support your work and the mental health piece and how we're providing supports for our drug and alcohol to our students. Yes, this work actually we believe will directly um, impact our student family handbook and our discipline procedures around those types of offenses. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hudson. Very exciting work. Um, this is um, great to see this moving forward. And I have board members, contact me if you're interested in being a part of this or any of the other project teams. And we'll make sure that um, someone from our board joins your team. All right. Thank you so much. Um, all right, next we have the action items, which is the consent agenda tonight. Um, do I hear a motion to adopt the consent agenda? I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. Second the motion. It has been properly moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda. Um, any comments from the board members? I just have one comment because on the consent agenda is the, um, the anti-racist vision statement and policy ACB. Um, and they have actually come to us from a long ways from the equitable policies task force. And I'm really um, proud tonight to be able to vote on that work uh, that came from our community and is now making its way uh, into district policy. And I guess uh, I'm assuming that this is going to pass in a moment. Um, and with that assumption, though, I just want to put out there a big thank you to all the members of the Equitable Policies Task Force who helped make that work happen. That's very powerful. Um, and I'm so excited to see it uh, go into effect uh, hereafter. So um, with that, I will take a roll call of the board for a vote. Um, and you can vote uh, yay or nay. Um, we will start with uh, Zone 1, Susan. Tom, I just want to ditto your comments before I say yay. Awesome. Um, zone two, Karen. Um, yay. And I also want to say that um, from our student advisory board um, brought up that uh, we had the first meeting and they brought up this fear that um, they were being impacted by what's happening in Newburgh. And they had a fear that our board would actually, the students um, named that that was causing fear in them and, and um, thinking that we were not going to be supportive of our um, gender diverse students and that we wouldn't be supportive of our black students. And I let them know in our student advisory board that we are supportive of our students and all of their identities and that we want spaces where there is no hate um, or bias toward them and also not, um, 
free of hate and bias toward our staff. So yeah, yes, yay. Um, zone three, Eric. Yay. Zone four, Sunita. Yay. Zone five, Regana. Yay. Zone six, Becky. Aye. Zone seven, Tom. Yay. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. And I think with that, uh, board members, do you have any uh, comments, any communication? Right. Seeing none, we will adjourn the board meeting. Um, we have an executive session. So if board members want to stay on the line here for our executive session, uh, we will start that in just a moment. And the board meeting is adjourned. <laughs>